Thank you so much, Cheryl, for that beautiful opening prayer and sharing your language with us, sharing about your family, um, and starting us off in a good way. Um, we have a really packed agenda for today and tomorrow, so I would like to just um, keep us moving along here. I would also like to remind all speakers and also people who are asking questions when we have the question period to speak slowly and enunciate um, your words as we have uh, a Zoom closed captioning that will be um, running in the background for those who need closed captioning in person as well as online. So just want to remind folks to um, speak uh, slowly and clearly so we can capture that. Um, and also just a few housekeeping things. There's going to be coffee and tea and refreshments out in the room um, throughout the day. And we'll break for lunch around noon. Um, and we have a wellness break as well around 10.30 this morning. So without further ado, I want to invite uh, Regional Chief Terry Tiji, who is our opening keynote. And unfortunately, he can't be here with us today. Um, he's had a recent injury. Um, he's OK, but uh, it has prevented him from being here in person. And he will be providing uh, opening keynote for the conference virtually. So for those of you who don't know Regional Chief Terry Tiji, he's a member of the Dekal, Gitsan, and Sakani nations, and also member of the Takla Nation. And Regional Chief Tiji is serving his second term as our Regional Chief here in British Columbia. So welcome, Regional Chief Tiji. Thank you. Can you hear me? Deneza, yes. Sekuza, Skyza. Uh, first of all, I, I just want to uh, thank you, uh, newlywed Chastity, for <laughs> uh, you know navigating us uh, for the next couple of days and and uh, chairing this meeting. Uh, first of all, I want to to acknowledge the uh, certainly I, I would have loved to have been there in the building in, in uh, uh, the Coast Salish territories. I want to acknowledge the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. I'm calling from the unceded, unsurrendered, continually occupied territory of the Kleetli Tene in North Central British Columbia. I uh, want to acknowledge and, and thank uh, all the territories that we are calling from. Um, my name is Terry TJ. I'm from Tapla Nation. And uh, I want to, to uh, uh, thank you all for uh, attending today uh, virtually and also in person. I also want to, to thank uh, Cheryl uh, Rivers for the welcoming prayer and, and, and the song to start us off in a good way the, uh, uh, to start the day, which is, which is uh, great to, to see and hear the language uh, from our respective uh, communities and our respective uh, uh, tribes, if you will. Uh, we hold here in British Columbia at 60% of all indigenous languages come from British Columbia. I do, uh, as, as a part of the uh, economic development portfolio uh, for the AFN, uh, I've been doing a lot of work uh, na nationally and on this portfolio, as well as uh, regionally with uh, a lot of work that uh, we've done with the, the black books, as well as looking at the concept for uh, an institute, if you will, a center of excellence here in, in British Columbia. And we continue to do a lot of that type of uh, uh, work uh, here from BCAFN. And also uh, looking at uh, different ways and means that we can really assert and implement the uh, United Nations Declaration of Rights for Indigenous People, as well as looking at, at trade interprovincially and, and internationally. And certainly, um, you know, true economic participation has, has has been missing uh, from much of the conversation with the province and, and our country for for far too long. And, and as we see uh, Bill C-41 and C-15, uh, respectively, the provincial and federal laws to, to implement the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, it is one of the pathways towards uh, reconciliation in this country. I would also like to take this opportunity to, th to thank the Chiefs and Assembly and all of you here today. Without uh, the collective work and, and what we hear from you, 
uh, you know, the work wouldn't be uh, getting done. Uh, so certainly want to uh, appreciate all the input that, that you have. Um, next slide. So uh, certainly uh, the future in, in, is First Nations as, as we've seen and, uh, you know, the many discussions we've uh, heard over the last couple of years uh, as we implement C41 here provincially to implement the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. And, and now, now as, as uh, we're coming to uh, the one year anniversary as the implementation of C50, the federal law uh, that was implemented and, and passed uh, Royal Assent uh, as of, of June 21st last year, uh, Bill C-15, the declaration. It certainly, uh, a lot of um, attention has been drawn for the last couple of years to British Columbia. We're in the enviable, enviable position to uh, seek uh, input and leadership in terms of implementing the, the declaration. Uh, I, I certainly appreciate our, our partnership with the province of BC, but it doesn't uh, mean that everything is within the declaration that needs to be implemented. Certainly, as we go through the, uh, you know, the many discussions and perhaps the negotiations with implementing uh, UNDRIP, there's uh, many court declarations that have recognized our ability to create our own laws and follow our own laws, whether it's Delicabu Kasteaway or the Tilkotin uh, court cases uh, have to be lived up to, as well as the, the many treaties we do have here, whether it be historical Douglas numbered and or modern treaties, the Nishka treaty need to be upheld by all levels of government and need to be implemented. While there are many years of work ahead, uh, there are burgeoning opportunities for First Nations governments and organizations. And, and certainly we've seen uh, in, in many decades, entrepreneurs, uh, First Nations entrepreneurs. These opportunities are, are the work of many years, uh, the work of, of the chiefs and assembly here in BC and across the country. Uh, certainly uh, more opportunity uh, over the next uh, several years. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Uh, the path forward, uh, certainly, uh, I, I believe that uh, we have choices to make. And also, uh, really, I think, uh, as, as a part of our, our political landscape is to, to push forward with reconciliation. And to note that no reconciliation without First Nations is really, I think, uh, uh, a detrimental way to go in terms of our relationships with, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the many levels of government. So as a part of that, it is implementing the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples and also uh, the, the federal laws to, to uh, implement the, these laws as, as a way forward. And I, and I think, you know, as, as more governments and perhaps even private institutions implement the, the many articles within the Declaration, the better off and, and the, the better relations there are with First Nations. Uh, certainly, we are at a cr critical juncture to ensure that, that uh, the many years of, of court declarations and advocacy is not lost. Uh, and also the secondary concerns, which create urgency for, for this important work as we move forward with the uh, reconciliation and the, our abilities to uh, create this space that is rightfully ours. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Uh, as we've, uh, in, the, in the last effort of several decades, the, the economic landscape in Canada, BC and the world has, has changed. And uh, we've uh, seen it over the last couple of years uh, during the, the pandemic, uh, how the, the economy is, is so uh, reliant on, on many, uh, I, I suppose, products and or services that we provide here in Canada. Uh, Canada is still uh, one of the main, main uh, economic drivers is uh, natural resources, whether it be oil, gas, uh, mining, uh, forestry. Uh, it is a uh, staple to the, uh, I suppose, the backbone of the, the Canadian economy. So as we continue to face these, uh, I, I suppose, the, the sustainable and or unsustainable practices, 
uh, needs more input from First Nations and also a different perspective in terms of uh, how we best uh, uh, develop in, within our traditional territories. Um, certainly, we've seen, uh, you know, the cost increases over the last several uh, years with the, uh, the food and goods and also fuel. We've definitely seen that. That has really, uh, I, I suppose, taken over the conversation about our economy. But we've also seen record numbers of, of increase in terms of, uh, of importing and exporting at the Port of Vancouver and the many ports here in Canada. So I, I believe there's certainly an opportunity there for our First Nations to uh, have more input in terms of, of trade. Uh, the market increase in shipping uh, year over year indicates the scope of the limited use economy. And as I said, uh, many of these, uh, of these goods have a, a finite life or they're, they're not infinite, they're unsustainable. You cannot uh, grow more ore or more oil and gas. So really, I think what we need to do is and think about as we uh, are have experience in the, the issues of, of climate change is, is go to a more sustainable economy. And, and we've seen this in, in our traditional uh, territories and uh, in our uh, ways and know, knowing and being our traditional knowledge is, is really having a, a more sustainable way of life. And, uh, and I think that more and more the conversation is going towards uh, using, uh, you know, what only you need. Uh, next slide. I want to thank you all for, for attending uh, this, uh, our uh, BC APN Economic Development Forum. Uh, we've seen uh, massive changes in the last couple of years with, with the pandemic. Uh, a lot of discussions that we continue to hear in regards to coming out of the pandemic building back better, uh, if you will. Uh, we need to be a part of those conversations. And, and it's definitely as a part of that conversation. And as we've seen in the last uh, several months is the, the, the term of reconciliation. Uh, as we've seen the, the discussion of what we've experienced with colonization over the last uh, uh, several hundred years and, and also the, the policies that were imposed in us. Uh, the, the residential school policies. And as we've heard in the last uh, couple of months, the apology from the Pope, the, uh, our perspective from, from British Columbia and Canada, our First Nations calling on the Vatican uh, to denounce and renounce the doctrine of discovery, the doctrine of terra nullius. And, and certainly that is a part of what we say is, is a call is reconciliation. Uh, I know we all want to go much further. We want to take these huge steps towards reconciliation. Um, but, you know, we move uh, in, in small steps, small victories, but we're going in the right direction. And British Columbia, I'd like to say, uh, in, in many respects in this country is leading the way. So it's, I hold up all, all of you, our, our leadership here in British Columbia and all the economic development leaders here in British Columbia for, for leading the way and in, in the direction and in the best way forward. So, so with that uh, chastity, I wanna thank you all and, and have a, a good two days of discussions and certainly know we have a packed agenda. Thank you, Masicho. Thank you so much, Regional Chief, for joining us this morning and for your inspiring words of where we're going in regards to Indigenous economic development. I just wanted to share that um, in my research, there's over 50,000 Indigenous-owned companies in Canada with a contribution of over $30 billion. And that number is growing every single year. And as Regional Chief Terry TG said, um, British Columbia has been leading the way in so many aspects in regards to UNDRIP and um, economic reconciliation, as well as uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So we have a lot to celebrate today, despite the challenges um, of the pandemic and colonization. Um, and so just really looking forward to the rest of today. Um, our next speaker, 
I would like to introduce is Michael Bonshore. Um, Michael is from the Zawa Dainuk First Nation, um, otherwise known as King Kaminlet. <laughs> and uh, he is the principal at Visions Financial Services and been an economic development advisor to the BCAFN for some time. Michael has more than 30 years of, of working within the financial and economic development sphere. And uh, he is going to give us an update on the BCAFN economic development portfolio. So without further ado, please welcome Michael Bonshore. Thanks, Chastity. Gilakai sa namut nuguam ikuigalau gaikala muskimuk zau dinok. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see some uh, familiar faces. Nice to see some uh, some new faces. So I'm here to provide a sort of a brief overview of um, the work that the BCAFN has been doing in the economic uh, development space. I've been um, uh, I've been had the opportunity for the past year or so to support support that work through my company. And uh, my first big decision of the day was, should I stand or should I sit? And uh, I think I'll, given that I've been at this so long, maybe I'll sit. <laughs> no. So just a, just a few slides, just to sort of to build on the, the words that the regional chief shared in terms of, um, I think he did, uh, uh, it is excellent to hear sort of the overview and some of the foundational thinking to the work that's being done by the BCFN and other organizations in, in the economic development space. I've, um, having been at this for, for a little while, I, I'm, in, I'm encouraged by what's happening now. I'm, I'm encouraged by the, you know, the, the uh, sort of the space that, that has been created through um, all of our communities work, all of our leadership's work to create more economic opportunities. And so really what some of these initiatives are about and some of the work that the BCAFN is doing and, and the uh, Leadership Council and other First Nations is, is really about taking up that space. You know, I think it's really an opportunity for us to sort of create the opportunities and, and uh, create the economic opportunities uh, on behalf of our, with our communities. So just a few slides just to, to build on uh, what was shared already, uh, I hit the button, do I point? Here we go. So I think the regional chief did a, did a nice job sort of, sort of laying out sort of the, some of the foundational work that's happening. Um, the BCFN has taken um, I think amongst the leadership council, uh, a leader, uh, taking a leadership role in, in economic development initiatives. And a lot of it's, uh, as you can appreciate, because I think, I think it mirrors uh, what's happening in our communities is that BCFN is taking a fairly holistic approach to its, to its economic development work. We can't really talk about, we can't really talk about economic development without talking about our people and in our in in our our territories, we got planted here. Our, our lands and our resources. You know, so much of our economic development work is is really um, built on and impacted by what's happening in in, in um, around us. Whether it's whether it is global issues or, or climate change and and everything else, and and the the, the demographic growth of our communities and so on, and, and our people. So. The, the, they've taken, I think, a fairly holistic approach to its to its economic development work. So I just wanted to, that sort of, this is sort of this view, this is kind of a view of, of the initiatives that the BCFN has been has been undertaking. Um, so one of the uh, one of the files that the that the BCFN has been leading is is work on food security, and there's a report that is. I think coming out in the next uh, month or so, it's been it's been drafted by by David by David Isaac and, and W Dusk uh, to, to 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 speak about 
food security issues to frame out a bit of a strategy around um, uh, you know our connection and uh, to to our, our traditional food sources and there is a although it might seem a bit odd to start off with economic development um, portfolio discussion about food security is I think we all realize that there is a connection between the health of our lands the health of our resources and economic development progress that we make and I think David I just saw that David is on the agenda for tomorrow so I don't want to um, although I couldn't really I don't want to preempt anything that he's going to he's going to share tomorrow but that's just to let everyone know that that he, he might have some definitive dates when he shares tomorrow about when that's when that paper is coming out so I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to seeing that um, uh, regional chief TG touched on the the black books initiative and um, for those not familiar, the, the Black Books were was a piece of work that uh, uh, was developed in, I think, in 2018, 2019, and it's a sort of a compendium of, of economic development toolkits and information that sort of it landed in, in four different books, and uh, they reside on the, um, they reside on the BCFN's website right now, and the reports and files, and it's really about background information, supporting information that uh, all of you can reference in, in terms of building your economic development strategy, building and implementing your economic development strategy. So, and that work is really founded on previous, in, previous works by the BCFN office in, uh, that, that spoke to governance. And so the Black Books is really intended to, to sort of build on that work and put it in a economic development context. And part of the sessions that we're having, and we, we just had a, uh, we have, we've had two sessions so far. We had one virtual one, and um, we had one uh, with real people in it. I'm not sure if they're paid to be there or not, but I think they're real, they are real people in Nanaimo. And we're having sessions uh, later this week in Prince George, and then sessions in June in Vancouver in, in, in the Okanagan. Uh, so you can check the uh, BCFN website for for times and locations for that. And part of the objective with those sessions is to uh, revisit some of the key pieces, uh, some of the key points um, of information that are in the black books, but as well gather feedback from the participants on uh, the, the the types of information that's in that's in that material and get some ideas from everybody on you know what is the what is the you know in terms of the tool and of the information and the information base what is going to be the most useful in terms of uh, uh, um, accessing it you know, right now they sit as right now they sit as four large reports pdf files on the website i think it's about nearly 300 pages or so so it's it's it can be a little bit uh, a little bit of a task to to find the, the exact piece of information that you're looking for so I think there's ways in which that we, we can improve on that to make it more maybe maybe it may a bit more direct for for the users and so we're just starting starting that process now so if you're um, uh, interested uh, look for look for these um, um, look for these dates uh, to there's about a three hour session that half day session that we're that we that we're putting on um, in terms of some of the other work that we've been doing um, uh, is uh, on the topic of procurement as you probably know the both of the federal government and the provincial government have uh, sort of stated that they're they're working on first nations or indigenous procurement strategies. Uh, the federal government has has targeted 5% of their procurement to go to towards First Nations and in, in the Indigenous community. Uh, the provincial government has been less uh, specific in terms of uh, those kinds of targets. Uh, but either way, you know, if it ends up being those kinds of numbers, it's it's a um, as we've noted in, in the in the deck, it's about five six billion dollars worth of economic opportunities and um, versus I mean it's, it's difficult to get current information on this but we estimate that you know if they're targeting five percent in indigenous procurement moving forward we estimate that the the current experience is less than one percent and so 
there's a lot of work to be done at both the federal government and the provincial government levels to uh, not just ch change what they're doing, but change how they do it yeah, to make economic and contract opportunities more accessible to, to First Nations here in BC and, and, and across the country. We've, um, we've had a couple opportunities to meet with key staff at the Medicine Ministry of Citizen Services. That's the branch that's, that's leading that work on behalf of the province. Um, it's been a little bit slow, to be honest, in terms of the shape that that, that work is taking. You know, we, we've shared with them other examples in, in other jurisdictions, you know, to the north of us in the Yukon, where they've established quite a comprehensive new uh, Yukon First Nation uh, procurement strategy and policy. Uh, so we've shared some of those examples where uh, also in, in Australia and New Zealand, which have in the past five years have reset how they how they approach indigenous procurement. And so there are some good examples, including what's happening, what's what has been happening in the uh, <laughs> thanks, Sarah. What has been happening uh, south of the line of us, and and the U how the U.S. tribes have, have leveraged the policy and legislative opportunities uh, to uh, in procurement. So there's a lot of work and a lot of a lot of opportunity there. Um, as well, uh, Chief uh, TG mentioned the Center of Excellence, and so that's an initiative we've been working on in the past year, um, with the primarily the provincial government so far to estab establish a BC First Nations Center of Excellence to focus to focus on economic development. You can see the vision and the mission there. Um, so it's it's an initiative that's been sort of communicated and supported through resolution at the last probably a couple uh, BC AFN assemblies and we're in the process of sort of finalizing um, the relationship with the province for them to look at partnering and providing resources to to the center so we're, we're excited about that we we built out a business case and a business plan for it um, and we're just waiting for 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 the, the, the resources to, to initiate the startup of it so one more slide on this so just to the, just to, to show the sort of distinction between the work that's going to continue to happen at the BCFN, which is really still focused on title and rights from a title and rights perspective, implementing DRIPA policy papers, research and political advocacy and forums, things like this, relationship building, where the, whereas the center is going to be more sort of uh, initiative focused, uh, be an information hub, as, as uh, Chief TG mentioned, uh, facilitating trade missions, investment marketing, partnership development, and perhaps down the road, this is a little bit further, more, more work is, is to be done in this, but a, a, the development of a sovereign wealth fund as well. And so we have a lot of, as, 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 you'll, as you know, we have a lot of uh, either sector specific or resource specific councils. And so the, one of the ideas behind the center is to have, a, have an office and some capacity and resources to aggregate and c collaborate and facilitate uh, economic development discussions for First Nations th through the BCFN in, in a bit of a, in a, in a consistent way. Uh, this is what the org chart might, might look like. Um, there's, so the biggest the main thing there, there's going to be an attachment to the BCFN with a separate board of directors. We're looking at it creating a not-for-profit within the context of a not-for-profit society. And I think that's, I can't read that, Sarah, but um, I think maybe uh, that's, I mean, some of the other work that's being uh, being undertaken that's probably worthy of mention is the work that the BCFN is doing and with the Leadership Council in the cannabis space. And so there, there have been previous sessions inviting First Nations to talk about cannabis jurisdiction, talk about cannabis economic opportunities, um, so that work is that work is continuing in partnership with uh, BC and Canada. Um, there was something else I wanted to mention. I can't think of it. I may I may think of it. But if there's any time for questions, I'm not sure. That's sort of a short list of what's going on um, within the within the BCFN on the economic development file. No time for questions. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, if you have questions, I think 
he may be around for a little bit, so if you wanted to have a conversation with him about what he s was speaking about, he'll be around for a little bit. Um, so lots of initiatives that the BCAFN is leading in regards to economic development, really exciting and upholding our nations and our people as we continue to move forward in this space. We're now gonna transition into having a panel um, that is joining us virtually. Uh, it is the Federated Cooperatives Limited Team. So who are they, right? Um, you may have seen them out in your communities with gas stations, the co-op gas station, co-op uh, grocery stores, wholesale, um, and manufacturing, marketing, and administrative businesses. They are owned by more than 160 independent local cooperative associations, and these local co-ops own and operate agro centers, food stores, gas bars, convenience stores, and home centers. Um, they have an Indigenous business development team um, who are joining us today virtually and they would like to speak to us about opportunities that co-op can offer to First Nations in British Columbia. So today we have Carmen Ironstar, who is uh, the Indigenous Business Development Manager at the Federated Cooperatives Limited, Vaughn Turnbull, who works with the Western First Nations, Amber Wilkie, who also works side by side with Vaughn, Mitch Cornelius, who works uh, with the grocery people, it says here on my notes. So I'd like to welcome them into our space here uh, this morning um, for them to speak to us about opportunities that uh, co-op can offer us here in, in British Columbia. Good morning, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, thank yep. you. Um, good morning, everyone. I want to thank you for letting us attend your forum today. We really appreciate it. I was actually in your territory last week. I had like a soil turning event into Kamloops, but I'm gonna let Mitch speak to that. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging that I live and work in Regina, Saskatchewan, located on Treaty 4 territory, the traditional lands of the Soto, Cree, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota peoples and homeland of the Métis. My name is Carmen Ironstar, and I'm Nakota, and my home community is Carry the Kettle First Nation, which is located in Southwest Saskatchewan. Again, I am grateful to be invited here and for my team to, the rest of the team to present and highlight some of the opportunities with our corporation. So just for some context um, and a little bit of background, in 2017, the Federated Cooperative Limited Board, or FCL, identified Indigenous engagement as a gap that needed to be addressed and prioritized. And that's really how my role as Indigenous Business Development Manager at FCL came about. FCL has a commitment to truth and reconciliation and responding to call to action number 92. And I think our development and prior prioritization of this unit demonstrates this commitment. In my role, my main focus is to establish positive business relationships between members of Indigenous communities, Indigenous-led organizations, and FCL and the Cooperative Retailing System, or CRS. This refers to FCL and retail cooperatives across Western Canada. A main objective is to advance mutually beneficial business interests of both FCL and the CRS, but also economic rec reconciliation with Indigenous communities that we engage with and work with. I, I want our interactions with Indigenous communities to extend beyond transactional. Like that is very important to me in my role and my team's role is to build those personal relationships. Of course, there is gonna be the aspect of business to business, but that is not gonna be our only focus and that's not my only focus. I see my role as a connection between FCL and the CRS and Indigenous communities. I want to go out and meet folks and visit communities and learn what your needs are and see if there's some way our organization can support your growth. So just um, like some of my short-term plans in my role here is to build this team out. 
I have hired an advisor for Manitoba and I will begin recruiting for Alberta. And on that note, before I introduce the next presenters, I'm looking to hire an Indigenous Business Development Advisor for the BC region. Um, so they would be my on-site support, making those connections throughout BC. So if you know of anyone who would be interested, please, please contact me. I will provide my contact, in, well, for the team also, our contact information to Sarah. So if anyone is interested or you guys have any questions after our presentations, please feel free to reach out. So now I'm going to pass it off to Amber Wilkie and Vaughn Turnbull. They'll be presenting information about a little bit about who we are at FCL and our Indigenous Gas Bar program. So it's off to you now, Amber. Good morning, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. And if you can't, please uh, feel free to put something in the chat and if you can see my screen here. Um, so as Carmen has mentioned, my name is Amber Wilkie, Sales Program Manager at Federated Cooperatives Limited here in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Today I'm speaking to you from Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of the Cree, Soto, Stony, Nakota, and Dakota, as well as the homeland of the Métis. I'd now like to introduce my co-host, uh, Vaughn Turnbull. Hi, thanks everyone for having us this morning. My name is Vaughn Turnbull out of our Calgary office, Petroleum Operations is my role here with Federated Co-op. Uh, today I'm speaking from Treaty 7 territory, traditional lands of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Sutena and St uh, Stony Nakoda Nations and Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. So today we want to take a little bit of time to go through who FCL is and uh, our program for Indigenous gas bars. So who are we as FCL? Uh, FCL is short for Federated Cooperatives Limited and we are a wholesaling, manufacturing, administrative, and marketing cooperative. And we serve independent local co-ops across Western Canada from the edge of Ontario right to the west coast of BC. Uh, our values uh, are focused around local. So we are locally invested. Uh, we grow and support local economies and communities. And we share our profits with our local co-ops who in turn share profits with their members uh, annually. Co-op is a community minded organization. <clears throat> so we live and work in over 500 communities across Western Canada and share our profits with members in these locations. We also donate uh, to grow these communities through community foundations and other nonprofit organizations uh, through cash and um, service. So of the local co-ops that we work with, this is sort of a breakdown of the type of facilities that are operated throughout the cooperative retailing system. So six types of primary facilities, <clears throat> those being food stores, home and building centers, gas bar convenience stores, commercial petroleum card locks, agriculture centers, and liquor stores. Um, FCL itself uh, owns and operates Facilities as well, so distribution centers or food warehouses, um, feed plants, propane centers, regional offices, fertilizer terminals, uh, petroleum terminal, and then our big uh, facility in Regina is the refinery and an ethanol plant in that location as well. So sort of the, the biggest uh, asset that we have is in Regina, that's our cooperative refinery complex. Uh, this produces the petroleum supplied to co-op and independent fuel sites uh, in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and some of British Columbia, uh, all out of this Regina refinery. So at the CRC facility, there's over 1,000 permanent employees, uh, over 5 million liters of petroleum storage, production at peak uh, production numbers is 130,000 barrels per day, and distribution uh, of about 17 million liters per day out to our facilities. Uh, to service locations across Western Canada that are further away from Regina, uh, that central refinery point, we have a network of corporate bulk plant uh, fuel storage facilities. So local co-ops will pick up fuel at these sites to deliver to their farm and commercial customers as well as Tempo and Western Nations independent fuel resellers. 
So pretty good coverage there, um, especially in the prairies. Uh, and then our fuel terminal is located in Carsland, Alberta, just south of Calgary. So this holds about 140 million liters of fuel <clears throat> and it acts as another distribution point in addition to our refinery. Um, construction is underway on a second fuel terminal right now that's due to open this summer in Ashcroft, British Columbia near Kamloops. So this will allow our co-op fuel to be distributed to locations across mainland BC. Um, when it comes to Vancouver Island and some of the lower mainland, we typically have exchange partnerships uh, for our fuel in those locations. <clears throat> All of the co-op, tempo, and Western Nations uh, facilities receive and are able to advertise top tier gasoline. Um, and our diesel fuel is either a standard grade or a top tier as well, depending on the province. So top tier is recognized as a premier fuel performance specification developed and enforced by leading automotive and heavy duty equipment manufacturers. <clears throat> so what this means is that the gasoline has specific additives and detergent properties that prevent buildups in the engine and clean any existing deposits on engine components. This is the fuel specification that co-op and really all major Canadian fuel retailers offer in the marketplace. However, many regional or local suppliers may not. And then co-op has two brands for independent fuel retailer partners. So the Temple brand has been in place for many years, I think since the 1970s, I wanna say. Uh, and it's our brand for independent fuel sites throughout Western Canada receiving co-op fuel supply. Um, up until last year, this was our program. Uh, and now we've launched another program called Western Nations. So a similar type of uh, program to Tempo, but it's specific to Indigenous uh, gas bar locations. Um, so co-op supplies fuel, signage and financial support for these sites. And Amber is going to go into some details about this exciting new program and some opportunities for partnerships in the future. Awesome. Ahead, Thank Amber. you so much, Juan. Um, so yeah, so Federated Cooperatives Limited, or FCL, uh, in partnership with local co-ops across Western Canada, are excited to announce its new and unique Western Nations brand. The Western Nations program was built on a foundation of you know, true partnership, using a very collaborative approach to develop the brand with Indigenous communities providing ideas, feedback, and solutions along every step of the way. So as a cooperative, we know that our business is built around communities and within those communities are built with its people. So when it came time to develop the Western Nations brand, we wanted to design a program that became the cornerstone of many local communities. So what makes the Western Nations program so advantageous to its operators is the access to the industry expertise in the sea store and gas bar business with high quality products, including top tier gasoline, which Bond had mentioned, uh, reliable fuel supply with all of the many local co-op locations across Western Canada, the grocery people, which Mitch will be speaking about in a few short minutes, and home and building supplies. So collaboration was integral to the effectiveness of the program, starting with the logo. So for over a year, teams worked with and solicited the feedback from Indigenous leaders across Western Canada to identify key elements of the Indigenous brand. So at the onset of the brand development, to provide some context, we wanted to integrate three key factors to our mindset. This included respectfulness of Indigenous culture, a modern and appealing and relevant brand to all customers with providing a unique customer experience. In the end, the focus groups selected Western Nations as the new Indigenous brand with several noteworthy facts about the logo. So at the bottom, the rich gold yellow color represents the prairies. A snow-capped mountain in the center represents the Rockies. The blue W represents the sky and movement of the wind. The two red triangles serve as anchor points, representing the connection and support of co-op. All of this tying back to Western Canada. So now let's just take a look at a couple images of the Western Nations branding. On the canopy, you'll notice that there is actually no line across the letter A. So Indigenous leaders really liked the fact that it looked like a teepee, and that was one of the pieces of comment when we were developing the logo um, that just came back from those focus groups. 
You'll also see on the pylon insert, uh, it says fueled by Western Canada, and that comes with the Western Nations brand. So as co-op is often associated with our high quality products, it is a key benefit to communicate and align with the Western Nations program and brand, receiving the same level of high quality fuel served to each of the members. So there are currently three operating Western Nation sites today, including one in Brandon, Manitoba, one in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, and one in Port Alberni, British Columbia. So here you can kind of see a few of the different facilities and what they could look like, um, you know, at various points of the day. So here's another image just of the potential layout of the site, in addition to a close up of what you could expect the pump dispensers would look like with the Western Nations branding. So as partners for Western Nations programs, uh, co-op wanted to set our operators up for success. So what does that truly mean? It means that our sites are competitively positioned in markets with financial support, grant dollars to invest in the location from an image perspective, as well as ensuring that the facility has the proper and safe petroleum assets and infrastructure in place. The grant dollars are negotiated at the time upon contract signing, so many of the details would be uh, discussed on an individual basis. So to develop a visually appealing modern facility, the Western Nations uh, image enhancements include new signage, pylon signs, header strips and building signs, conversions to LED, uh, pump decals, the backlit fascia for a bright canopy, new electronic uh, price signs, painting of a pylon sign, canopy, light poles, etc. And then as well, painting for the above ground tanks. And then as well, um, you know, new siding for an existing building or painting um, that as it may require. So in addition, there are funding um, programs to support the communities in this endeavor of opening a new Western Nations uh, site. So this includes the development of maintenance and promotional assistance programs. Um, so specifically starting with our maintenance program, the funding assists with the repairs and maintenance of petroleum assets. So owning and operating a gas bar, uh, you will have many of those. So repair costs to uh, the pumps and tanks, which include calibrations to the meters on pump dispensers, and then as well, annual cathodic protection tests on underground tanks and lines. As well as our promotional assistance, whereby FCL provides the dealers uh, with the opportunity to promote their location, their fuel offering, and then as well, the Western Nations brand. Um, we offer some uh, promotional assistance for TV, radio, newspaper, billboards, uh, sponsorship ads, giveaways, and uniforms. So part of what brings the professional look and feel to the Western Nations brand when a member might come in to uh, visit one of your sites is really the high quality standards of the Western Nations uniform program. The program includes a wide variety of attire, including jackets, hoodies, uh, long sleeve shirts, t-shirts, polos, etc., um, as well as a wide variety of high vis and flame resistant uh, clothing for the added safety of your employees. So within FCL, we have a team of experts who design facilities for our own local co-ops, um, and those same experts would be shared um, to support our Western Nations sites um, and their partners. So the program would include assistance in site planning for both new builds and upgrades to existing sites to help ensure that a facility appropriate for, is appropriately sized for the opportunity. So this means that the team provides project planning, construction coordination, site plans and drawings, as well as a floor layout plan. The team also works together to ensure that the facility is right sized. So when we say right size, the development process equips uh, each site with the proper capacity, the right number of pumps, and then as well developing an appropriately sized convenience store uh, to enhance your member experience. Some independent dealers do have a very good idea of what they want for the exterior and interior design of their location and what that looks like. However, others are looking for some assistance. So we can um, provide some assistance to those dealers. And there's a couple of options. So one is to have a Western Nations branded site as we've seen um, in previous images, 
or maybe the indigenous group does have uh, something specific to the community that's already existing that they would just like to incorporate, um, you know, on the exterior or interior of the building. So an example could be a TP on the exterior of the building as seen in some of the previous images. So this is where FCL would come in to help support our operators. So we're pretty flexible when it comes to working together um, with each individual Indigenous group on the site brand and development with the community, um, you know, and just also leaning on our experts internally. So that includes our uh, marketing and communications team, facilities, design and development, and more. So this is what you could expect, um, you know, a potential Western Nations branded site to look like. Um, so very professional, very organized looking. Um, and you'll notice that right behind the pay point section, um, we really bring the brand from the outside in. So you'll notice that there is logo and um, branding inside the store. And then just as an important, um, you know, as important with our exterior of the stores, um, we want to bring and complement some exciting products and promotions developed with the same level of attention to detail and innovation as our co-op stores. So we really utilize the knowledge of the tried and true uh, co-op C-Store program to develop the Western Nation C-Store program. So what does this include? This includes seven promotions, a food service program, and planograms as well as access to co-op programs, including Big Cool, Ice Chiller, and Twist. So a unique feature of the Western Nation Sea Store program is the Spirit Bear Coffee program by Canterbury Coffee. So just as co-op has its cooperative uh, coffee program, Spirit Bear is designed specifically for the um, Western Nations as an indigenous focused coffee program. So Western Nations focuses on sustainable growth and development with local communities. So as a result, we've also included a community building assistance program. So the program is really designed for funding for initiatives and projects that provide value for the members in that community. So there are three key programs that are developed um, in which these can be funded. So the first one is capital in, or community infrastructure. So that's capital investment to upgrade or build cultural or recreational facilities, um, community programming. So that's programs or activities that promote community development, including heritage, knowledge, um, or transfer. And then as well, community events. So that might be standalone events, ceremonies, and activities that foster a sense of community and culture. So lastly, the Western Nations program also includes a POS system. Um, but you know, before we get to the POS system, I did want to just share that um, there are different types of partnerships that we can establish. So one being the fuel supply to existing Indigenous gas bars. Um, so that could be if you're already in partnership under an existing brand, we may look to just help provide fuel. Um, the second one would be an existing gas bar site that would be interested in converting over to the Western Nations brand. And the third would be um, a new build of a Western Nation site starting from the ground up. So as I had mentioned, we do also provide a um, POS system that would be important for rebates, um, including submission and collection. And then as well, we can help subsidize the cost of the POS system through uh, some of the grants. Lastly, I did just want to touch on, um, because co-op is such a wide variety um, of retailing partners, we do have several other commodity lines that really would complement um, any Western nation site. So starting off, um, you know, we do offer co-op lubricants. Um, so these are made and manufactured, um, you know, in Western Canada and served to Western Canadians. And then as well, we also have co-op propane, which also as Vaughn touched on, we do have over 23 locations scattered across Western Canada um, that would be able to uh, service any of your bulk or um, Western nation site needs. So if you are interested in adding um, co-op lubricants or propane at your Western nation sites, um, we can include those details in further conversations. 
So I just wanted to, before we closed, uh, leave up our contact information in case you are interested in, um, you know, pursuing a Western Nations site within your community. Um, we're again, very thankful for your time and for allowing us to share the details of this uniquely um, Western Canadian Indigenous brand, Western Nations. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to, I believe, Mitch. Hey, thank you so much, Amber. Now I believe I can share my screen. Uh, I appreciate the introduction and uh, really appreciate everyone having us today. Um, first of all, I want to mention that I am speaking to you from my home office in Treaty 7 territory, the traditional lands of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Tsutsina Nation, the Nakoda Nations, the Métis Nation, Region 3, and all the people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Mitch Cornelius and I'm manager at the Grocery People. We are the independent business unit of Federated Co-op that supplies food across Western Canada to locally owned and operated independent food stores. Uh, I wanna take a little bit of time to share with you a really quick overview of our program, uh, just to give you a sense of another line of business that FCL operates in. Uh, more than that, I want to share with you several stories of First Nation communities that we're currently working with in a variety of creative, creative ways. Mitch, Without Mitch um, I don't know if you're sharing your screen yet. I appreciate that, Carmen. Thank you. Can you see it now? Yes. Yeah, it's now. Okay. now. Uh, thank you for speaking up. I'm sorry about that, folks. Um, I, I do want to share with you uh, several stories of First Nation communities that we're working with. Um, I don't want to overstate the progress that we're making on our reconciliation journey as an organization, but I do want to share how much we're learning and how much we're growing as an organization. Definitely uh, far from perfect, but I trust you will see our efforts to support First Nations communities as a first step in reconciliation, including efforts to promote food security and food sovereignty, uh, through the grocery people and our supply of food. Uh, as, as we mentioned before, FCL is committed to building sustainable communities together. As the supplier of food to independent business uh, through the grocery people, we have six, a 65 year track record of ensuring our retails are able to run viable businesses and retain their independence while building for the future. So I'm just gonna flip the slide. I trust everyone can see it. Um, our TGP clients are supported by a large number of people who work uh, for FCL. So, of course, we have uh, specialists that uh, are specifically in grocery and able to support uh, folks who are, who are going into the food business. But I don't want to miss the folks who, who are behind the scenes supporting our clients. Uh, from customer service and marketing, to logistics support, we're here to ensure that your business can be successful from the start. Uh, it's definitely not only the people that you see working for you, but a whole bunch of other dedicated individuals who are working hard behind the scenes. Uh, I should mention here, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, the QR codes or how, um, how big this is on the screen you're looking at but you should be able to pull out your phone as I'm talking uh, and just scan that little QR code. It'll take you to a, a website if you want some more information about uh, our private brand. And you, you may be familiar with a, a variety of private brands um, that, that are available out in the marketplace, but these are just a snapshot of a few of ours. Uh, what sets us apart from the competition, I would say, is that our independents have access to the same line of products that all co-op stores have across Western Canada. This uh, might not sound like much, but access to these products provides stores with a variety of uh, high value quality products that are locally sourced right through Western Canada. The other thing I would mention relative to, to this group and this opportunity is this is a market that's somewhat underdeveloped in the BC region, which we believe provides huge opportunity 
to provide consumers with a new product uh, that they're looking for that's high quality and that represents Western Canadian uh, values. So as I mentioned before, if you want some more information, try to scan that code or we can uh, share a, uh, a copy of this presentation. You can get more information. Um, I would love to, to have samples for everyone and hopefully we'll be able to do this in person pretty soon uh, because the, as, as exciting as they are to hear about, they're more delicious to try. Uh, I assure you of that. Um, just to give you a sense of, of our offering, in addition to food supply, we also offer promotional material as well. So this includes our advertising program and our marketing program. Uh, we offer this for a, for a fee um, to our clients. It includes print and digital, social media. We definitely recognize that the world is changing and we want to ensure that we're on the leading edge um, of technology and also ensuring uh, environmental responsibility. As the world shifts away from, from paper, we uh, have a, an online option for our flyer. And then of course, social media, Instagram and Facebook presence that, uh, that we're really trying to build. Again, this code will lead you to uh, an example of an existing flyer. All you have to do is type in your postal code there and you can see uh, what we're all about online. Um, I'm just going to flip through this really quick. If we get down the road and you want to hear more about our POS system, uh, like our friends in Western nations, we also offer a um, POS system that covers both the checkouts as well as the back room, call it front office and back office. Uh, it's through lock software, but fully customized through the grocery people. Um, of course, we offer ordering devices, ways to get your groceries, and then really great reports as well. So this is just one example of many, but you can track your business year over year. And of course, we can offer that support. So you might be wondering, you know, where do we start? Where do we even, we, we even go from here? And uh, I like to consider uh, our people as one of our biggest biggest assets. Every store has a dedicated operations advisor that's focused on you and your success. They're backed up by the larger TGP and FCL teams that we talked about to provide specialized support on everything from fresh meat to fried chicken and everything in between. Uh, strategic advice and guidance for your store management team. Our experts are focused on you and helping your business succeed. Many have owned and operated retail grocery stores before, so they, they certainly understand all those aspects. In addition to um, the, the operational support we offer, we offer, also offer um, our independence opportunities during rebates through their wholesale purchases. Um, so our fresh rewards are a B2B program, earn cost reduction and warehouse rebates are based on your purchases. Uh, as a business, and then um, those specific funds are given back to you on a yearly basis. Happens around Christmas time. Uh, who doesn't love a Christmas bonus? Um, and, and also keep in mind that we offer development grants for a new store build. So, so those would cover some of the costs of the POS system that we talked about or, or any other community initiatives that you are looking at. Uh, I wanted just to take a few minutes as we're closing up here to share with you what this looks like in real life. Uh, these are a few examples of what we're doing with our First Nation partners. Uh, this is an example of a beautiful store located in Southern, Al Southern Alberta. Um, the interior, uh, what we're really proud about is that the interior represents not only a grocery store, but the community and speaks to the, the heritage of the community. Uh, you can see on the bottom uh, left-hand corner there, the signage above each department speaks uh, specifically to um, the community's language and is really designed to preserve and enhance uh, the, the local culture and the offering in the store. I'm really proud of the work that's been done. Um, and, and this store also offers a tremendous fresh food option as well. So the local sandwiches, 
Uh, they offer fried chicken, and I can assure you I've tried it a few times uh, that the, the offering is, is really tremendous, and it serves as a, a really fantastic uh, source of food security and food offering within the community. This is just another example of, of one of the things that we can do for, um, for customization in terms of, of that marketing effort. So you can see it's a, it's a kickoff to powwow season, and we have highlighted some, some specific items that the community had asked for, uh, in addition to um, a local picture and, and a draw. So we've been able to support uh, this specific organization through the pandemic with supplies, uh, community bulk orders, and orders for local organizations to ensure that, that they can consistently um, support their community members. We're really proud of the work we're doing, but also tremendously proud of the lessons we're learning along the way. And in, in this example and so many others, it's, it's truly a partnership. Um, just one more, one more example of a creative solution that we were able to facilitate between an existing TGP retail um, and a Manitoba-based First Nation organization. Uh, the organization reached out to us mid-pandemic to help support their, their community, their local food bank. And, uh, you know, in, in this particular circumstance and under the uh, time constraints that we had, really setting up a full account, turning them into a, a grocery supply account didn't make a lot of sense. And so we reached out to one of our existing clients uh, who absolutely jumped at the opportunity to support their community in this way. So not only were we able to support the group through the pandemic by offering food supplies, but uh, I'm, I'm just really tremendously proud of the, the partner retail and that strong relationship uh, that they formed with uh, the Bear Clan Patrol out of Winnipeg. You know, I, I don't want to overstate it, but I, I do want to say that in my opinion, this really embodies the spirit and the culture of, of our organization, TGP and FCL, um, the creative business solutions that are, are truly in the best interest of everyone. Uh, my, my vision for the future is that we create a retail partners that, that are able to capitalize on these, these partnerships. Um, we're working on a model that would more easily create the opportunity to, to capture these and there's more to come on that, but uh, is we're still developing it. And we're we're really quite excited about um, ensuring food security, building community, and uh, creating those partnerships as we go. Uh, so so with that, I just want to take another moment to express um, our sincere gratitude for for having us today. It's truly a pleasure to work with, with First Nations communities across Canada. And while, while we as an organization have a lot of learning to do and a long way to go in terms of our reconciliation efforts, um, we're confident we are, are moving in the right direction and look forward to continuing the conversation and the progress together. So with that, I, uh, I wanted to share this uh, one more QR code with you. If you bring up your phones and scan it, it'll pop open your email client. I've just populated it with a little subject line in there as well as uh, an initial sentence, uh, but feel free to, to send me an email. Would love to chat more and, uh, and connect with everyone as we go. So. Thank you, uh, enjoy uh, the rest of the conference and we look forward to, to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Carmen, Vaughn, Amber, and Mitch for giving us a thorough overview of the opportunities um, for First Nation communities to partner with you um, for gas stations and grocery stores in our communities. Um, I just want to check to see if, Carmen, if you had any final comments uh, as we wrap up your panel here. 
Um, I just want to thank my team and thank you guys again for allowing us to present some information and about our organization. I would like to remind anybody in the audience or online here, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out um, and we will, I will connect you with either Mitch, Vaughn or Amber, and I will send my contact information to Sarah. Thank you very much again. Great. Thank you, Carmen and team for all your work that you're doing uh, with our communities. This brings us to our wellness break. Um, we will, yes, thank you. <laughs> Everybody's clapping here for you if you can't hear that. Um, thank you for being with us this morning. Uh, we'll now break until 10.45 um, and there's coffee and refreshments just in the other room. And we will be back with a, another wonderful panel of building relationships through banking. So see you at 10.45. your own individual businesses and those are just things to just keep in mind um, as you're planning as you're planning your own your own journeys okay I got I got one more for you and then I promise you can ask me something <laughs> I like to grill him this is this is my role in our relationship <laughs> so on that note still further how does one invest within a business like what are some of the things you look for good good question um, so Part of my role is we invest in markets. Um, we don't do a lot of investing in private businesses, but we look for a number of things, you know, and, and, and it applies to, you know, anyone's business. We look for cash flow. Is there a positive cash flow? Is there a wide moat? Are the, is the business, are their earnings sustainable? Uh, are what they doing, uh, do they make money in good times and bad? Do they have pricing power? Do they have the ability to grow? Are they innovative? You know, there's lots of new technologies coming out. Are they are they taking part of those technologies? Are they are they actually coming out with the technologies? And there's lots of great global businesses out there that meet those uh, terms. Whether it's in healthcare, whether it's in technology, whether it's in communications, um, pharmaceuticals, those types of things. And so we look for we look for that. We look for themes. You know, we I'm a big believer in demographics. Um, and we want to make sure that whoever we're invested in is taking advantage of demographics. So, I mean, just looking into the room, uh, I'm Gen Xer. So, how many Gen Xers are here? Just a few. And then how many baby boomers? Just a few. And millennials? Anyone under 40? So, just uh, as, a, as a question, well, we all usually hear about baby boomers, and baby boomers are the large percentage population, which, which they are. So in the US, there's about 50 million baby boomers. Uh, Gen Xers, you know, uh, my age group, there's I think 35 to 40 million of us. But any idea how many millennials there are? Christy, any idea how many millennials there are? Cool. <laughs> <Take it. I've laughs> are we talking just, just like? Just in the US, just millennials. There's 70 million. Okay, that is there's nowhere more, close to what I would have yeah, guessed. Yeah, <laughs> there's more millennials than there are boomers. Um, and then, so when, when we're looking at businesses and we're looking at investing in companies, you want to see, okay, so and that's why you saw Amazon take off. That's why you see all these different changes in the economy is because you have this massive demographic that no one's really talking about, um, making shifts and making things happen um, within global economies, right? Because you have this huge population base. So we look, we look at that as well. So there's a wide variety of things that we look at when we're investing funds for our clients. Um, but those are some of the, some of the main things yeah, thank that, you. that we look at. On the flip side, so I'm on the investment side, Christy's on the lending side. 
Um, so Christy, I mean, business is so diverse. Um, what are some of the things that you look for when you're about to lend to a business? And how important is it to have a credit profile? Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Um, you know, it's, it's funny, just prior to uh, coming up on stage here, I was having a wonderful conversation with, uh, with uh, Jason and Candace, who are right over there. And uh, we were talking about credit profiles, and uh, we were talking about how vital it is to understand a credit profile uh, no matter what age you are and no matter if you're in business or individual because they're so intermingled. So some of the information that I'm going to touch on is perhaps a little foundational uh, to some of you, but this information is needed. And my ask of everyone in this room is if you already know this, that's fantastic, but take this back and share it with your communities because this is information that's vital to the growth of uh, whether, again, it be someone in their youth to understand going forward or someone that's uh, beginning, whatever beginning looks like to that individual. So uh, when we look at credit profile, we'll take a step back and just say on a high level, a credit profile is the, uh, is the history of your credit usage. You get points when you use that credit as it was intended, and you lose points if you mismanage that credit for whatever the reason may be. There are two reporting agencies uh, in Canada, TransUnion and Equifax. These are private companies. However, they are very restricted in the information that they will uh, share with certain parties. Uh, building a credit and maintaining your credit uh, takes access to banking. We're going to talk about that further. But there's lots of tips and tricks that I can give you when it comes to maintaining, building, or uh, if you've had a bumpy past with credit, I can give you lots of tips on how to bring it back to life and bring your score higher. But I think the bigger question here, and uh, Chastity touched on this in the introduction, is what do you do if you don't have access to credit? You know, what if you do, what do you do if your nearest bank is over six hours away and you don't have reliable transportation? Or what do you do if you're in a community that doesn't have reliable internet access? Or, you know, maybe logistics isn't an issue for you at all, but what do you do if you're uncomfortable walking into a bank because of the systemic uh, ideas that have been held? What do you do then? So those are questions that uh, Scotiabank has been taking very seriously for a, for a really long time, you know, we didn't just start this conversation now. We, we were the first bank to open an on-reserve branch back in the 70s, and that was in Standoff, Alberta. We've since opened three more on-reserve land. We also have Indigenous banking centers from coast to coast. This is not a new conversation for us, but it is an evolving one. Um, when it comes to working with the remote nature of some of our communities, Scotiabank actually approached TransUnion, one of those reporting agencies, and said, hey, how can we help our remote communities track credit ratings better? How can we make it more accessible for them so that they don't have to travel 12 hours to stand in a line to feel not welcome? How do we change that conversation? So those are the, some of the things that we've done to try and change the conversation around building and maintaining your profile. And, to loop this back into business, the reason this is so vital is because uh, typically with businesses, we check your personal credit. We get a personal credit guarantee from you. So if you've tarnished that personal credit history, chances are that's going to follow you into how you do business. And when you come to uh, a bank like Credit, like uh, like Scotia Bank, we're going to want to partner with you, but we're also going to be looking at your personal credit history is an indicator to how you might manage the credit into the future. So that's why this is such vital information. Um, as Chastity pointed out at the very beginning, there are 50,000 or more uh, Indigenous-owned businesses in Canada, and Indigenous peoples are opening up businesses at a rate five times faster than non-Indigenous people. So 
obviously we want to bring this conversation to the forefront. We want to make it easier for you to open those business and to uh, generate those billions into the economy. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> when you're talking about credit profiles and those things, and you did mention some of uh, you know challenges that are out there, but can you give an example or can you speak to how um, if you have advice from the beginning or setting up how it can impact someone's business and the ability for when someone comes into a branch or they go to any bank really and try to get a loan, you know, having that profile and having that background can really impact them and, and make it easier or, or help them in, in which way? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So for, for a newer business, um, uh, for, any, for any business, but definitely for those of, of more infant nature, um, your personal credit history is usually the only indicator we've got uh, of how you manage credit because your business hasn't yet built that profile. Uh, it doesn't have that history. So we rely uh, heavily, if not solely, on your personal credit background. So that's why it's just so vital. Yeah. Um, and I know um, we're talking about new businesses and, and whatnot, but there's lots of very successful dev uh, corporations out there across the province and across the country, um, and they're doing fabulous work. And some of them have started from some th nothing, and some have actually um, purchased businesses. Um, so when you're looking at starting or purchasing a business, uh, what are some of the characteristics that you look for when someone comes to your desk with a, a loan application? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, great, great question. Um, definitely true. You do not have to start a business from scratch. There are lots of businesses out there that are looking for uh, new ownership for whatever that reason may be. So what, what, what I might suggest you think about prior to even starting the search is doing that internal search about your purpose or the purpose of uh, the Economic Development Corporation. What kind of business are you looking for? Where is that business located? Who are the business customers? And, and importantly, uh, where are those business customers located? You really want to get those things sorted out because buying a business, is, looking at businesses, or starting a business can be a very emotional journey. So that, uh, that emotion can sometimes get in the way of some objective decisions that we might make. So having that clearly defined list or purpose or mission statement of yourself, the, uh, the ECDEV Corporation or of the partnership, however you're going to approach that, is the most important thing. Uh, you will want to, and, and engage, your, engage our, your bankers in this, you know, I, I, hope, uh, I hope that you would feel particularly after this conversation, hope that you feel you can trust us and bring your ideas to us uh, because we'll sit down and we'll talk to you about what, uh, what we see in that industry, what we see in the future of that industry. We see a lot of different partners and businesses in our day-to-day -day world and we would love to uh, share some high-level insights of different industries that we see going on all throughout BC. Uh, so know your industry, know your purpose. Uh, if it's available to you, if you're purchasing a business, know the numbers. Uh, sometimes you might have to sign a non-disclosure agreement, an NDA, to look at numbers. That's fine. Go ahead. Uh, they do have to share them with you, but uh, you know, bring them to bring them to us, your banker. I, I've done that a number of times with businesses or people looking to purchase a business where we've gone over the business financials and just talked about them on a high level. How would a bank view this? Um, you know, those bankers were bound by confidentiality, so you're safe in coming to us to have that conversation. Um, so those are those are some of the things. And, and just, again, always checking in with yourself. Am I being objective? Is this decision based on my principles, my purpose, the purpose of my community, or the purpose and mission statement of my act of? When, uh, oh, sorry. Just I'll ask one more. Um, sorry. S a lot of ECDEV corps are now partnering, right? There's a lot of limited partnerships that are being set up. Um, individual businesses are, are using partners, whether it's to add expertise or add capital, um, those types of things. 
Um, what are some of the things that need to be considered and really looked at when you are thinking of adding uh, a partner? Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, many, uh, many Indigenous peoples choose to look uh, at limited partnerships as a, a way to do business. And there's a variety of reasons of that, which, uh, which I won't get into, but you're welcome to, to chat with us after about. But the, the partnership approach in general is really, really important. Uh, when you think about going into business with someone, it doesn't matter, and I, I cannot stress this enough, it doesn't matter how much you know someone, how much you trust someone, how much you love someone, uh, get a partnership agreement written up. With both parties involved, everyone being transparent, but have a partnership agreement and take it seriously. This partnership agreement uh, should list roles and responsibilities clearly, and it goes over what to do if there's uh, a dispute. So that's, that's really important. The other thing with a partnership is you wanna know who you're partnering with. This is someone that's going to share your vision, your story, your brand, your legacy. So talk about, be transparent with them. What is there, you know, we talked about the importance of credit bureaus, credit rating, credit profiles. What is theirs? Order a report. You can do so online. $15, I believe. I do it annually. Uh, order that and have a real discussion about things before you go down that path because you want to know what the obstacles are before you get going, if there are any, rather than finding them out along the way. The other thing is know their strengths, know what they bring, know your strengths, know what you bring, and hopefully they offset each other. Your strengths are their weakness, your weakness is their strength. Um, but those are some of the most important things when we look at doing a partnership. Uh, again, emotional decisions, so checking in with each other to be objective, and don't think that it's a one-sided thing. You can't ask the other party to divulge everything in their closet without doing your own, so have your information ready at hand, your, uh, your personal situation, your credit r report ready to share. Okay. Um, and actually on the, the partnership topic, um, Sad, I'd love to get your insight as to uh, partnership and how it flows into the governance side. Sure, I know we're running out of time already. It's like, oh, we, just, it's like we just started. <laughs> we're just getting going. I want to keep going. Um, yeah. Um, so on the governance side, so everything that we do when we work with communities is, as Kirsty mentioned, is for me, it's very much about generational wealth, it's very much about purpose, it's very much about goals, it's having those deep conversations with community leaders and community members in terms of determining what is it that we're trying to do, what does success look like, you know, what's success five years from now, what's success five generations from now. And, and work work backwards and determine how do we how do we best do this as as our team as your team in your communities, um, and part of that is governance right is having the structure set up within your whether it's your active corp, whether you have a board of directors you know the trust how is your trust set up, uh, what type of trustee do you have what type of governance is put in place there it's a much broader conversation obviously we just don't have the time to get into we can we're here we can have this conversation with any of you or you can reach out to us online. Um, and have that deeper conversation, but having those conversations, um, linking everything back to what is success for the community is, is, is vital. Um, not everyone has those conversations, but they really should be having those conversations and having good governance, whether it's at the council table, whether it's in the, in the business itself, the active business, your own businesses, is absolutely crucial. Um, and it will pay dividends long term when you have good governance uh, in, in, in place um, and getting educated around how to have good governance because there's so many different strategies and things that we can do. And like Christy said, you know, stick back to what is your, what is purpose? What is it that you're trying to, to accomplish? Um, so I think, are we actually like, we're done now? Okay, that's it. All right. <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> um, well, I'll just put, say one more thing. Um, we are hiring. If anyone out there, uh, whether you're virtual or here, you are interested in banking, you're inv in, interesting in the investment world, uh, we have branches all over the place, as I'm sure you're all familiar with, please come and see us, come see us outside, and uh, we're definitely hiring. And we've got lots of cool initiatives and things that we're doing, which uh, we can't really talk, I guess we can't get into, but. <laughs> Too bad, we, ha we, we would have kept you all day if we could have. <laughs> you guys are lucky. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Satveer and Christy, for being with us today. And um, for those of you who are in the room, they, the Scotia Bank does have a booth here, and so they will be here for the two days. Um, and Satveer and Christy will be here with us today as well. So, if you are interested in having those deeper discussions, please reach out. They will be here. And thank you so much for taking the time to be here and thank sharing you. all of the wonderful things you're doing. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, we have one more speaker before we break for lunch today. Uh, last but certainly not least, Miles Jolliffe, who's in UV Alouette um, and has a strong connection to the Mackenzie Delta region of Canada's Northwest Territories. He's a professional engineer by trade. He has over 20 years in the field of Indigenous relations, and he is the founder and CEO of Kinetech Canada, an early stage Indigenous startup with an innovative solution that provides access to capital for Indigenous equity participation in the Canadian natural resource and infrastructure sectors using public markets. And he's going to share about all the wonderful work that he's doing with our communities. So without further ado, please welcome Miles up to the stage. Hello, um, there we go, presentation. Uh, I'd just like to say thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm not First Nations, I'm an Inuk from the Northwest Territories, uh, but I uh, recently moved back to Calgary from Vancouver, so Vancouver uh, feels like home. So I'd just like to you know, acknowledge the traditional territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, this is a real passion of mine, uh, Indigenous equity participation. Uh, and uh, you know, the front picture is a picture of a sharp pencil and uh, kind of get into that later. But uh, I think Indigenous equity participation, uh, the key uh, to the Canadian economy and unlocking its potential. Just a little bit about me. Um, uh, uh, Nuviawit, so Mackenzie Delta. So you can, not sure if you can read that, but about 21 100 kilometers uh, north of here is a little community called Taktiaktak, and that's, uh, whoop, oh, there we go, <laughs> and uh, yeah, perfect, thank you. Um, and uh, that's, that's where my dad's family comes from. Uh, I currently live in Calgary, and uh, uh, after recently uh, moving from Vancouver, <clears throat> came out to Vancouver for uh, the Simon Fraser Executive MBA in Indigenous Le Leadership and Business. Uh, best opportunity uh, or best uh, program I think I've ever been exposed to and uh, I'd recommend it to anybody uh, uh, thinking about doing uh, an MBA. Um, uh, as part of my journey in Indigenous uh, equity participation, the Mackenzie Gas Project, they had 30% uh, equity set aside uh, uh, through the Aboriginal Pipeline Group and that's really where I first got exposure to this concept of ownership in major projects and so kind of grabbed hold of me. Um, just uh, maybe a little on the, the yellow boxes here. As part of my MBA uh, in you know, finance and studying different uh, projects, I looked at the East Tank Farm deal involving the uh, Suncor, Miccosoo Cree, and Fort Mackay uh, 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 First Nations in Alberta, and that was a $500 million uh, equity deal uh, that was, I think, the first of its kind where the Indigenous communities went to the bond market and uh, raised money to buy into a major infrastructure project. It's kind of uh, reignited my passion or hope that uh, change was possible and that companies were willing to work with Indigenous communities on a scale, I think, that's needed uh, to address uh, the social problems that I think are commonly seen across many communities in Canada. And just a little bit on Trans Mountain, uh, that's what I picked my capstone project on, so looking at uh, creating a supporting bid uh, for the Indigenous communities along the line, so looking outside for the rest of Canada, bringing uh, Indigenous uh, communities into what I thought was going to be a government sale of the pipeline, and that's still evolving, but you know, uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about how to 
get communities uh, access to uh, equity ownership in, in major projects. And, and then most recently worked for Coastal Gas Link as a Indigenous Relations Lead, working with the communities, uh, uh, implementing project agreements and being that, I guess, front face of the project uh, between the, the company and the communities. So, and that's my business card. If you guys are interested, I, I have a stack of them. Uh, all right. So I, I did mention I was from Calgary, and I realized that it's going to be the Battle of Alberta. Maybe picking Wayne Gretzky wasn't the best choice, but uh, I, I do love this saying, uh, you know, skate to where the puck's going, not where it's been. Um, I think Indigenous equity ownership is where the puck is going in Canada. The, the changing regulations, all of these things are, it's a tailwind, and uh, I think we can take great advantage of it with, uh, uh, if some new tools are created, and we'll get into that, but... Uh, this is nice. I've been doing this presentation to uh, private equity folks and bankers, investment bankers. I spend a lot of time on this slide. I don't think I need to do it so much with this, uh, with this group of people or the people watching. Uh, I think everybody in this room knows what's happening, and it, it's great to see Indigenous empowerment, self-determination, um, changing uh, regulatory laws to uh, free, free and prior informed consent. These things are are instrumental uh, for what I'm about to talk about, so continue on. But uh, I just, you know, within that free and prior informed consent, I just wanted to, you know, touch on a few things that, you know, compensation for lands and, and what does it really mean to be compensated for lands? Um, I think that means being an owner. I think that means having upside to, uh, you know, resource commodity booms, not just getting an annual payment. I think those are great things, annual payments. Uh, those are tools that are, are doing great work, but I think uh, more can be done. And so uh, I just think within the, you know, the changing regulations that we're going to begin to see more uh, equity ownership in these uh, major projects because uh, we deserve it. And, uh, and uh, I think the communities acknowledge that it creates alignment uh, between the communities and uh, the, 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 their shareholders and really the objectives they're trying to achieve in terms of development, socially minded development, I should say. So kind of getting into the problem, I think uh, probably many people would acknowledge that access to capital for indigenous communities is probably the, the biggest barrier, if not uh, you know, maybe one of the biggest barriers. I, I think in my opinion, it, it's the biggest barrier to addressing socioeconomic issues. And uh, most recently, uh, Coastal GasLink sold 10% of their pipeline, uh, so TC Energy sold 10% uh, to the affected communities, 16 communities along the line. Um, what was a little disappointing is that there was another 10% on the table and they weren't able to realize that. And so it kind of made me realize new tools are needed. Um, great work's being done, but uh, I think more can be done. And so uh, on the left there, you can kind of see the, the counterparties, the people who have uh, uh, long-term shipping agreements with the uh, Coastal Gas Link that underwrite the the, uh, the the project, and you know these are basically the biggest names in the world. You've got Shell, Petronas, uh, that's PetroChina, and you know, the government of Japan and Korea through their their gas companies. So, you know, all of these these parties are you know when when you're looking to uh, borrow money, they always ask you. Know, who are your counterparties? You know, what kind of risk do you have? And well, these are the biggest names in the world and still having challenges, so. Again, it's similar, I'm not sure if anybody, uh, well, probably many people went to the First Nations Major Project Coalition uh, Net Zero Conference. Um, similar uh, uh, themes, you know, being expressed that uh, change is happening, um, but also that, you know, more needs to be done. And, and that's what's great about these conferences is getting people in the room and discussing it. Um, but uh, I think you can get uh, maybe into kind of the way, I guess, equity is, is created. And when I'm talking about equity, I'm talking about, you know, in the, the many hundreds of millions of dollars in terms of uh, uh, the major projects. So not, not small, um, not small, you know, 10 to $50 million projects, but really billion dollar projects where, you know, um, uh, equity is for the indigenous community could be represented, measured in several hundred million dollars. And so uh, 
I've outlined here, I guess, what I just call the, the proponent or company lead method. And uh, it's it, it, great work's being done with it, but I think, you know, opportunities are still uh, uh, being missed. And, uh, you know, the proponent lead method is really uh, the proponent uh, allocates uh, a portion of the equity in their in their major project to the affected communities to create alignment. I think we're familiar with uh, several of these examples. Um, most recently, Coastal Gas Link. There is uh, I touched on that one, but the uh, the Clearwater uh, yeah Clearwater seafood deal uh, that was over on the East Coast. That was another great example. Uh, about 500 million dollars for those communities in terms of debt, and that you know. We'll, will materialize, sorry, debt and equity that, you know, will uh, support their community needs uh, by delivering revenue. And that's what I'm talking about, own source revenue, um, getting, you know, the, the upside for, for uh, the, I guess, the activities that are taking place on, on uh, Indigenous lands. And I touched on these tank farm deal there. Um, government support. so. Obviously, um, the government does have a major role to play, and and you know, uh, and there's great programs out there. I'm not sure if they're all being utilized to the extent uh, that the people who uh, develop those programs would like to see, um, but that they they do support through loan guarantees, equity ownership, and purchasing uh, into major companies. Um, most recently, Northern Courier Pipeline, also the Cascade Power. Those are both. Uh, through the AIOC, that's the Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation, uh, Crown Corporation with a billion dollar uh, budget to support Indigenous equity ownership and resource development. Uh, I would you know, strongly suggest BC look at uh, setting up something similar um, uh, in terms of supporting communities in their goals to achieve equity ownership. But within each of those mechanisms i think there's some flaws and i've outlined them here and i think ultimately the proponent uh uh the proponent method uh it's you can only uh, allocate or uh uh it's effectively giving away their their economic uh benefits on major projects you can only do so much of that before projects become uh, uneconomic so um with that you you also are, have a fiduciary duty to your shareholders, and that's you know major companies. It's not necessarily their prime objective to uh, you know create indigenous equity. So there's uh, interests aren't properly aligned. The government support method, um, probably many people in this room know maybe better than I do, but that you know, it's a slow process. You know they're not into taking risks, and rightfully so. You know as a taxpayer, you don't want them allocating money to, to bad projects, but at the same time, uh, uh, th there's a lot of limiting factors uh, about uh, uh, how, how government lends money to Indigenous communities. And uh, again, the, another fiduciary duty, you know, government's acting on behalf of taxpayers. So uh, I, I guess for me, the major takeaway is, is that communities aren't necessarily talking to the right people. Um, the people who are willing to take risk, see benefit, in uh, aligning with a community. There is uh, an entire pool of investors that you know, would certainly see value in having uh, indigenous ownership and resource projects to help, especially as we're moving into uh, a new regulatory environment. I think there's competitive edge for those companies who can adopt it first. Um, and uh, we can get into that. So a new solution. So. This isn't the only solution. This is a solution that I have, uh, I guess, you know, through, through, I guess, my work and study and just, I guess, call it tenacity, uh, just continue to, you know, plug away at. And I think I found something very interesting here. Um, just a little bit uh, about the company, I guess, uh, a little plug. Uh, so early stage uh, startup, pre-product, um, uh, indigenous-led, we have an uh, innovative solution for access to capital uh, in the natural resource and infrastructure sector, so land-based activities, so where there's going to be impacts and, uh, you know, there's, there, or there has been impacts or there could be impacts. And what is, I think, unique is that it's looking at public markets. So I'm just going to get a water.
and I think uh, the solution, it creates a true partnership. And that's what's really interesting for me is that it aligns the communities with the companies. And I think that there's a lot of great alignment that does happen, but the type of, you know, uh, having equity ownership in a company creates, I think, a true partnership. And, and that word partnership for me only means equity. I mean, there can be, uh, you can work productively with indigenous communities, but if you're not an owner, uh, I'm speaking of, uh, say as an indigenous community or indigenous person, if you're not an owner, you might not act like an owner. You'll, your your, your uh, alignment isn't uh, as good as it could be. And I think, uh, again, going where the puck is, rapidly changing political and regulatory environment, which empowers indigenous communities to ask for more and demand more. And, uh, but at the same time, to facilitate those partnerships, new tools are needed. And uh, kind of like this, the classic business question, what valuable company is no one building? And I think at the start of COVID, I, I read a book and that was the question. And so <laughs> I ultimately ended up answering it. It was very, wasn't what I set out to do, but anyway, the universe has a different uh, uh, plan, I guess. I, and the answer to the question is a public market solution uh, that enables indigenous equity participation in the resource and infrastructure sectors in Canada. So you know, that vision, uh, we are going through a transition, you know, uh, ups and downs, as, as the, the previous speaker said, it, it's, uh, um, there is uncertainty, but we also know that, you know, we're, we're going through climate change and that uh, uh, a transition is happening. And I'd like to see, or at least the, the company I've created, you know, enable a just and equitable energy transition for indigenous people in Canada. Mission, you know, create alignment uh, through uh, ownership in resource development, it have uh, indigenous uh, values represented at the board level uh, on those publicly traded companies. I, I didn't touch on it, but I think there's 11 indigenous people that serve on the board of directors in Canadian companies. Um, uh, I think resource development is about 25% of our economy. You know, you know, many thousands of board of directors. You know, we're nowhere near that 5% threshold of having board representation. And so, uh, you know, I'd like to see that changed. Uh, and goals, you know, unlocking opportunities. So, um, the creating uh, through that partnership, you create new opportunities and new ways of looking and acting and thinking. Uh, you know, provide ESG investors, investors in public markets with a way to support indigenous communities um, so that they can, you know, say, yes, we're, we're into. Uh, metals and mining, but we want to also support the indigenous community and we see value in that and we think that those companies who can create that alignment will be better placed in the future and something that's auditable, something that you know if uh, you put money into this stock, they're talking about stocks, um, that you can measure or report back to those investors how that money has flowed to the community. About two months ago there was an a ESG report that really caught my attention and it was right after Russia invaded Ukraine and uh, Russia was the recipient of almost three times the amount of ESG investing money than, Can than Canadian companies. It was, that blew my mind. I said that's something needs to change in terms of that. Like they, they only measured the E and that was the environmental or, or sorry the emissions uh, and that Russia could I guess attract more capital because their E was smaller and I just said I think if we can put I in that ESG, putting indigenous people into those publicly traded companies, I think we'll attract more of those dollars. So just, you know, with that in mind, I guess this is kind of uh, how the process I went through to get to the solution. And uh, uh, I think the solution, as I touched on, uh, it has to have a true partnership that indigenous uh, values, indigenous presence needs to be taken into account very early in, in a company's life cycle, and, that, and that's very hard to do after the fact. Um, I think indigenous values, they need to be represented uh, at the level in which you know, major decisions are made. Um, putting that I in ESG, uh, putting indigenous people into those board seats uh, on public companies so that they can articulate, uh, well, concerns or ideas uh, that maybe non-Indigenous folks just don't have, uh, it's, it's, well, different, 
different backgrounds, different, different points of view, I think, coming to better solutions. Uh, and <laughs> the solution for me, it was certainly public markets. So go where the money is. You know, there's, there's an entire pool of investors that would be more than willing to support this type of idea. We just have to find them. So give them the, the product to invest in and, and deliver. You know, deliver uh, uh, making sure you're returning capital and return on capital for, for the risk uh, that you're, you're, uh, every investment has some level of risk, obviously. So matching that accordingly. Um, and, and maybe I'd just start by saying, or not start, but uh, just touch on that, at least for the, probably the first iteration of this idea, you know, not really looking to use indigenous money, looking to use non-indigenous money. You know, startups are risky, so trying to use uh, money that is in communities, trying to put it into communities, not take it out. So, you know, just, just to be uh, clear about, you know, I guess what I'm trying to, you know, establish and set up and, and with who. Uh, and, uh, and I think, you know, uh, the solution, it needs to just use the tools that are already there. So I think all the tools that we need to solve these problems exist. It just, they, it needs to be rearranged and, and maybe marketed and sold better. So, um, so uh, it's, not a, it's not a crypto SPAC. It's not a, uh, well, it is a SPAC. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a crypto or a blockchain thing that it's using existing financial mechanisms that uh, are well established and used uh, in finance all around the world. So, <laughs> stepped on my own toes here, but so this is the mechanism I think which can help facilitate uh, access to capital for indigenous communities without them having to put up money. Um, you know, a SPAC is a special purpose acquisition company. Uh, try not to use uh, financial jargon, but this is probably the only jargon uh, I'll use today. Um, it's also known as a blank check company. Um, during COVID, I think about somewhere in the neighborhood of $200 billion was raised using this mechanism. So very uh, well established and well utilized. As part of that, it might have been overutilized. And, uh, you know, there's certainly strong critiques of them out there. And, uh, and just like, uh, maybe I'll, I'll touch it. A SPAC, it takes a private company public. And so just like it's, a, it's similar to an IPO, an initial public offering. Um, uh, I think we did the, the hands up that people remember the dot com bubble. That was kind of an IPO craze. Uh, we've kind of just gone through a SPAC craze. Um, and just like anything, there's good ideas and bad. Um, and you know, I think the good ideas will continue to use this mechanism, just like and I, good companies continue to use IPOs. But what's interesting about this mechanism is, is that uh, it, it changes the sequencing of money so that uh, you go out and raise a blank check, you raise $400 million, and you have uh, autonomy to go out and say, uh, I'm interested in metals and mining. Uh, I don't know what uh, area or what uh, project I'm interested in buying into, but you have the money in hand so that when you find that uh, transaction uh, to buy into, that uh, you don't have to go and raise money. And that was what really caught my attention is, is that it pulls you know, the, 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 the problem of access to capital right up to the front, for, you know, which is indigenous communities, they uh, often don't have that capital and it's very hard to go and create it, create it one off. And so this is a pool of money that can be allocated in looking at different uh, deals. If uh, uh, imagine many communities have different deals, uh, but uh, that it, you would go around and look and vet uh, which deals make the best sense, and then, uh, but the cash is in hand. And so it's very, it's very interesting uh, product for sure. Um, so. Uh, I guess maybe just touching on, you know, creating those benefits and alignment from the community and, and what equity ownership can do. Um, you know, own source revenue, uh, putting board of directors uh, w that are indigenous uh, into those board seats um, and finding ways to make sure that the, the benefits uh, are actually reaching the community members. Uh, many communities don't have that capacity, so all, uh, supporting, uh, supporting communities in finding uh, uh, what are their needs? And so that's done through engagement, uh, you know, with elders, knowledge holders, the active folks, staff, elected, hereditary chiefs, you know, getting to know the communities and understanding uh, what their needs are. And through that, 
uh, I believe you know you can uh, either allow them to allow the indigenous communities to uh, self-direct the programs or if they're not in that place that help uh, help make sure that um, the own source revenues are flowing to uh, where the need is the most whether that's housing infrastructure language and culture programs and all these things where you typically have to go and get grants and you know very uh, uh, other mechanisms but that uh, instead of having to ask this is uh, I guess piggybacking on what the, the previous speakers were talking about is that, that wealth, creating wealth and, and then uh, using that wealth to solve uh, community problems on their own terms. And yeah, this is, uh, yeah, I, I think the time is now for a number of reasons. Um, I touched on the changing political and uh, uh, regulatory environment. Uh, I think here is, you know, the, uh, R Russia is the, the world's largest landmass of a country, and they just took themselves off the market for the, the next 10 years, call it. So that's an opportunity for Canada. Canada is the second largest country by land mass. You know, we, obviously, we have resources, and those resources just got a lot more valuable. Um, you know, you can see on the left here the different types of uh, products that Russia exports. I like that graph because it has Canada beside it, so we're already naturally aligned in some of those spaces. On the, on the right there, it's the different oil companies that have basically uh, left Russia, and rightfully so, and that those oil companies all of a sudden have much less production or reserves that they're going to need to uh, explore and, and develop in order uh, to make the energy transition happen. It's not going to happen overnight. I think we're all realistic about that. And so um, continued investment in oil and gas, as, uh, however unpopular that is, is a necessity. And, uh, I'd rather come here to Canada than you know, other parts of the world where uh, their environmental and human rights standards aren't as good. We're not perfect, but you know, we're pretty good. Um, and again, this is, this is even just maybe b beyond the, the Russia and the, the geopolitical issue. We're in a resource-constrained world. We're looking at uh, creating new energy systems. That's new demand for all kinds of products. Uh, this investment was already uh, happening before uh, the Russian invasion, and you can just see, you know, the annualized returns of lithium, magnesium, cobalt, uh, and so uh, probably not telling you guys anything you don't know, but uh, I think Canada can help fill this need. And but in order to do that, uh, you want to create alignment between the communities and the companies doing that development, getting them working better, faster, smarter. And, uh, and I think indigenous partnership and ownership is, is a solution to that uh, problem, or let's say situation. And just highlighted there, the US government looking to work with Canadian, uh, the Canadian government to help you know, uh, solve some of the supply constraints around battery materials. Well, that's great. You know, hopefully the Canadian government is realizing that it's not at the expense of our regulatory and consultation uh, with communities because that's a non-starter. Uh, yeah, and so you know, right now I'm just you know, looking to have discussions with the communities uh, who are interested or, different, or have different opportunities, uh, better understand the landscape, and uh, uh, yeah, while well, I continue to you know, go build a team and, and find investors, but I guess the, the discussions have been exciting, and uh, this was, I guess, the first pass of in presenting it uh, uh, more publicly instead of uh, boardrooms, so uh, with that. I'd say thank you and uh, happy to take any questions. There's a lot there. Does anybody, yeah, we can, round of applause for the amazing work that you're doing. I think there are some questions oh, if you want to stay up here. I, oh, we've got a mic already, perfect. No, it's perfect. I, um, so I was wondering about your thoughts on moving from the bottom line being in participation for Indigenous communities, being procurement, into um, moving through that being equity. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, the, the targets you know, that the federal government uh, has placed on procurement, 5% uh, 
procurement target. Uh, I looked at that and I said, that's, that's a great start. We should also set targets for uh, equity ownership in linear infrastructure, create that demand, get, comp get that expectation out to companies that um, you know, the communities that are impacted uh, should have ownership and upside, material upside to uh, the activities that are taking place. I think it's all part of uh, a package solution around, um, well, part of, you know, good consultation and engagement, good procurement policies, good uh, education and training, hiring programs, but also, uh, you know, I think what's missing at, and at the scale is, is, is equity ownership in, in, uh, in those major projects and, and companies that really have an impact in Canada. Thanks for the question. Great. I'm standing between everybody and lunch, so I, I understand. Uh, um, you know, I'm here both days. If you want to have a uh, discussion, um, you know, please just gra grab a hold of me. Look forward to talking with you guys. Thank you. That's great. Thanks so much. Thank you again, Miles, um, for all the work you're doing within that space. Really inspiring to see the innovation that uh, you're getting ahead of the puck. I think that was the... Going where it is. Going, where the going towards the puck, right? I, you can tell I'm not, uh, I didn't play hockey in my early years. Um, but thank you so much for being here. We had a full morning um, with a lot of different speakers, starting with Regional Chief Terry TG, followed by Michael Bonshore with a panel with, from the co-op. Um, and then Scotia Bank and ending the morning with Miles. So it's been a full morning with lots of information. I've been asked uh, if the PowerPoint, um, uh, the PowerPoint presentations will be available. Um, they will be posted uh, by the end of the week um, at events.bcafn.ca. And that's the same link uh, that you use to register to be here for the conference. So all of the um, PowerPoints that uh, the presenters that are willing to share with us will be posted there for you to find um, and to bring back to your communities. We are um, a few minutes ahead of schedule here, but I'm sure nobody will be um, will be <laughs> upset about that. So for those of you online, um, we're going to be breaking till 1 p.m. and hopefully you have a nutritious lunch uh, wherever you're at. And for us here, uh, we will have lunch served um, buffet style in the next room. Make sure to check out the vendors um, and booths that are in the hallway as well. There's some lovely products uh, that are indigenous owned um, and other vendors that are here so if you've got a few moments, make sure to check them out in the hallway. We're also going to be doing door prizes today. So we're going to have one door prize at 1 p.m. to sort of energize our afternoon. And then we'll also have two um, as we end the day around 425. So to be eligible for the door prizes, you have to have registered for the conference. So if you haven't done that, make sure to go and do that. <laughs> and, um, and you also have to be in the room and be present. So, or on Zoom and be present on Zoom. So uh, we'll be going through the door prizes at 1 p.m. today and at around 425 this afternoon. So um, I know that they're going to be really awesome door prizes. So hopefully you've registered and uh, enjoy your lunch. We'll, we'll come back around one o'clock. I'll give about a 10 minute warning when we're close to reaching the one o'clock mark so that you can um, just wrap up your lunch hour and we'll see you then. So if you want to wrap up your conversations,
grab your coffee, your afternoon coffee, some water, make that lunchtime purchase out at the vendor's table. We'll be starting in three minutes. Thank you, everybody. Good afternoon. That was probably the longest three minutes <laughs> um, yeah. in the history of time. <laughs> so thank you for bearing with us. We have a full afternoon of inspiring speakers with us here. I hope that um, those who are calling in from Zoom had a wonderful lunch and a break and got to get up and stretch. Um, the lunch was delicious here uh, and really good to start catching up with folks again. Um, and before I invite up our next speaker, I had promised to do a door prize. So I'm queuing Joanna, um, who has the wheel with everybody's name who's registered here uh, in person and on Zoom. So if Joanna can get her wheel up then we will do the first door prize. And you have to be either on Zoom or in the room to win. So click to spin. I wish we had like a drum roll. <laughs> Thank you, let's see. Catherine Blackstock. Is Catherine Blackstock in the Zoom room? I know she's not here because I haven't seen her, so I'm hoping she's in the Zoom room. Who's able to tell me? No, she's not there? Okay, next, Joanna, spin again. Scott Harrison. In the room, Zoom or live? Okay, spin again. <laughs> Chris Letkobit Carpenter? I'm getting blank stares. No. Next. We'll get there. Hannah Gunnerson? <laughs> 
Do we have Hannah in Zoom land? Oh, awesome. Congratulations, Hannah. Uh, Joanna, yay, we're clapping for you here, all excited to save us from more names. Thank you. <laughs> and on. also, yay. So somebody from BCAFN will be in touch to grab your address and they will mail it to you. So congratulations, Hannah. We have two more door prizes at the end of the day. You, deal is you have to be here or be in Zoom. Um, and uh, I would love to be able to introduce you to our first afternoon speaker, um, Ian Simpson, who's from Snanaimuk. He is the CEO of the Petroglyph, Deve Petroglyph Development Group, which oversees the management of multiple Snanaimuk subsidiaries. These entities have operations in forestry, land management, and development, parks and tourism, marine transportation, and fuel service. So please help me in welcoming Ian to the stage. Good afternoon, everybody. I'll just sit down here. Uh, my name's Ian Simpson. Uh, my traditional name's Yakumton. Uh, I'm from the Snanaimo First Nation, and I'm the chief executive officer of our economic development group, group Petroglyph Development Group. Um, I guess today I'm, I'm really just here to brag about my nation a little bit and uh, all the work we've been doing uh, over the last, uh, last few years. Uh, and some of the projects we've been working on. Um, I, I really think uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the credit for the you know the the really rapid progress we've had over the last four years is uh, is due to uh, the visionary leadership we have in in Stenemo from uh, our chief and council and Chief Mike Wise, who uh, was elected just over four years ago. Um, and was acclaimed again recently. The last couple mo couple months ago, we had another election, and uh, he he was uncontested and and voted in as chief again. And we've been uh, we've been uh, rolling uh, really hard with uh, with him uh, him at the at the helm there. Um, but some of the some of the projects uh, that that we've uh, kicked off over the last few years, uh, a year and a half ago, we started. We broke ground on a 172-room uh, hotel in downtown Nanaimo. It's a courtyard by Marriott Hotel. It's a, you know, almost $40 million project that we'll, uh, you know, we own uh, the majority of, which is really exciting for us. We'll be able to open the doors there in, in January and uh, and hope to have some BC AFN events there in the future. Um, we we partnered with a, a a group out of Utah called Peg uh, on that on that one. Peg Peg uh, had hadn't had a lot of experience in Canada, um, but had a uh, an agreement with Marriott to to build a, a few hotels uh, across across Canada. They they finished the first one in Prince George a number of years ago, uh, and then moved on to Nanaimo where where they're at now and. We partnered with them, and it's uh, it's been a really great experience so far. Um, we've also recently started another uh, multi-million-dollar renovation project uh, right beside the Departure Bay Ferry Terminal. There's a there's a property there um, that's been really underutilized for for many many years. Uh, Growing up in Nanaimo, I can't remember anything kind of ever being there. It was originally built as like a Granville Island type uh, uh, type destination on the waterfront in Nanaimo, and for the most part has been uh, vacant for the last few decades. Um, so we we picked up that property, and we've been uh, 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 we've we're well underway on the renovations there, and um, it's going to be a pretty special place uh, in Nanaimo. Uh, on the waterfront there, uh, in the in the very near future, towards the end of the year, we'll be we'll be wrapping up uh, most of that project. Um, a year and a half ago, too, we opened the doors at our our gas station in Stenemo, which has uh, uh, been a huge benefit to to our membership in particular. With these crazy gas gas prices, we're all experiencing. So to be able to uh, you know provide that small benefit of of uh, money off at the pump is 
has been a really great thing for our membership and has been you know providing a steady revenue stream to our our government for sure um, we also we also um, are working on a 32 unit townhome development uh, in Nanaimo as well uh, we're, we're going through the rezoning process on that so we're fairly early stages but it's uh, uh, it's a it's going to be again yeah, another really beautiful site on the on the Chase River in Nanaimo on fee simple property um, our backbone of our group of companies at PDG in Nanaimo has really been our forestry company um, seven or so years ago our nation signed uh, phase one of a comprehensive reconciliation agreement which saw about a thousand hectares of uh, privately managed forest lands transferred over to, to the nation. Um, that thousand hectares, hectares has represented, uh, you know, well over $20 million in, in income to the, to the nation, which we've been, you know, able to reinvest in our, our, our nation's economy. And recently, our phase two of that agreement was signed, uh, which is transferring over another 3,000 hectares of privately managed forest lands. So, uh, you know, we'll be uh, unlocking a lot more economic potential through that uh, uh, through that table. Um, a little bit more recently, we picked up a property in the fall um, on the waterfront in Nanaimo that we've. Uh, uh, we've started uh, plans to uh, build a marina, so we're going through the submissions to the FO and, uh, and stuff on that one, which is really exciting. Um, there isn't a lot of uh, uh, information we've made public on that one yet, yep. but uh, look forward to sharing more, more, more in the future. future. Um, also, a little bit more recently, we, we opened our first uh, uh, cannabis retail store about three, three months ago. ago. On reserve, um, it's only a couple hundred square feet, but it's you know it's it's already making money, money for us and providing a, a steady stream of income and uh, and jobs for for our people. Um, we also have a second licensed location. Uh, uh, we haven't haven't opened yet. yet. That uh, that, uh, that uh, it was licensed under the you know the typical provincial uh, regime. The, the, the first location that we opened was through. Uh, uh, negotiations with the province. We entered into a Section 119 agreement with, with BC. Um, with, uh, the Section 119 of the Cannabis Control Act um, allows the province to enter into uh, agreements with First Nations uh, in BC uh, to, um, with, with respect to cannabis retail and cultivation operations. So um, BC's market for cannabis retail is I think pretty notoriously uh, cumbersome. The, you know, the fees are, are high, the red tape to cut through is thick. Um, so uh, I think it's a, just a, it's an important thing I wanted to highlight to, to anyone here who's looking to uh, you dive into that uh, that that space. It's a um, it's an easier route, in, in my mind, anyways, to uh, open up a store on reserve and provides um, some some benefits that other retailers wouldn't necessarily have have access to. Um, for example, um, tied house rules, uh, which basically we, they would normally would prevent um, retailers uh, cannabis retailers from participating in cultivation activities with a section 119 agreement first nations can uh, participate in both and have uh, like williams lake is is now doing have uh, true uh, farm to table cannabis production um, and have your 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 cannabis grown and sold at the at the same spot which you know provides for a number of things like you know much higher quality fresher product which uh you don't really get with the current provincial regime everything's sold everything that's produced is sold to the province as a wholesaler and the province redistributes it to retailers uh, across the province which 
sometimes leads to a uh, product being on the shelves that's a year or, or more uh, old. Um, but yeah, that's that's all I really wanted to to share with you all today. And um, if you have any questions, I'll be I'll be around. <laughs> and um, and if there's uh, any of you that are you know that are are um, working towards or already in any of the spaces that I that I spoke about, I'd I'd love to uh, love to chat with you uh, about uh, how we can work together. Uh, I'm really excited to have our section 119 in place so you know we'll, we'll be able to um, work with you know Williams Lake and Cowichan uh, there's a few other nations now that have section 119 agreements we'll be able to cut out the province uh, to a certain degree by directly from from these nations and sell their products and in our store and vice versa and I, I think that's a really exciting opportunity but uh, yeah thanks for thanks for having me here today Thank you so much, Ian, for sharing about all the exciting things that you're leading on behalf of your community and, and being open to sharing um, your path forward and, and all of your successes and challenges as well with all of us here. So um, Ian's around for the next couple days if you have any questions or want to reach out to him. So the next speaker we have today um, who I admire and have watched for a long time from afar is Inez Cook. Um, she is a, a woman entrepreneur extraordinaire uh, and she not only works for Air Canada um, but has started um, the only Indigenous restaurant in Vancouver that's been um, successful for many years here and uh, she's also just on the cusp, like the verge of opening a second location at Vancouver YVR. So now we can get Bannock and Salmon on the run. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, and Inez is a proud member of the New Hulk Nation. She was born in beautiful Bella Coola and is known for her determination, strong work ethic, and commitment to community. And as I said, she's co-founder and, and owner of the award-winning Salmon and Bannock Bistro, Vancouver's only First Nation restaurant. And please make sure to visit the second location at YVR when it opens. So please help me in welcoming Inez Cook to the stage. Thanks, Chastity. Good afternoon, chiefs, respected elders, family, and friends. Yas Madam Hooks, Ansla Inez, Ansla Snitsmana. My name is Inez Cook. My traditional name is Snitsmana. I was asked here today, originally, I thought I was just going to talk about. Um, the challenges of having a business in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and now uh, I heard that I can talk a little bit more about my story and how Salmon and Bannock came about. So as Chastity said, I work for Air Canada and uh, today is kind of a special day. It's my 25th anniversary with Air Canada. Thank you. And I was waiting for this day so I can give my notice. <laughs> I'm going to be retiring from, from Air Canada. So some of you know me, some of you have heard my story, some of you haven't, you're going to hear it again if you're bored. If you've heard it, go get a coffee, it's all good. Um, uh, so I've been in the airline industry for 31 years and I've traveled the world and I have visited cultures and I've tasted food from all of the cultures all over the world. And my dream was to open a restaurant and take people on a journey. And um, I thought, how cool would that be? Come to a restaurant and 
you have no idea what you're going to be served and you'll feel like you've traveled. So that was really my dream. Um, let's go back a little bit. I am part of the 60s scoop and um, most of my life, uh, I knew I was indigenous, but I didn't want to be. And uh, it was the N word. I wasn't allowed to be called native in my home. And I hadn't seen any role models when I was younger growing up. And um, as I started getting older, well, I lived in Saudi Arabia, I lived in Africa, I lived in India, I lived all over the world. And I was yearning for culture, searching and searching and searching for culture and searching for somewhere to belong. And I learned enough Arabic to shop and take taxis and order in restaurants, but I wasn't Arabic and I could pass for one, I could look like one. I studied Spanish in school and I tried to fool people because mi nombre es Ines, it worked, it had, a good, it had a good ring to it. But then when they answered, I didn't know what they were saying, so that didn't last. <laughs> um, I studied uh, radio broadcasting, was my studies, and I used to be a DJ. So I thought, okay, let me move to Montreal, let me study French so I can uh, come back to Vancouver, break down the composition barriers and work for CBC or something cool like that. When I got to Montreal, I studied French and I started flying for the airlines. And uh, that's when I started to meet the world. And I wanted to meet the world and I wanted the world to meet me. And um, 1997, Air Canada was hiring French speakers, and they hadn't been hiring French speakers in a really long time. So it was a good time to come home. I got Vancouver-based, I got, it was amazing, it was everything lined up, it was time to come home. And um, I started working with Indigenous colleagues at Air Canada. And I was like, there's one girl in particular, and I said, oh, you know, where are you from? And she's like, here. I was like, oh, I know, but like, I think you're native. And she's like, yeah, I'm New Hulk. And I was like, oh my God, is that how you say it? <laughs> I've been saying Nuxhulk my whole life. I had no idea. <laughs> and um, then she went and talked to her family and, and she left a message in my mail folder saying that I was invited over for a family dinner. And all of a sudden I felt sick to my stomach and I thought, oh my God, what if we're related? And what if my biological mother's sitting at the table and this is way too much and forget it, I'm not going and I'm not ready for this, this is way too much. So I lied and I said I never got the message. And uh, I met her later and she said, I left you a message, oh really? And I completely lied about it. it I just wasn't ready. And, um, but I started to meet other indigenous colleagues and uh, ask questions and I started to dip my toes in and I wanted to know more about being First Nations and Indigenous and um, I was in Kelowna during the wine festival and I saw a big sign that said don't panic we have Bannock and I went oh my god stop the car right now <laughs> there's Bannock and my friend was like, what is it? What is it? I thought that was a Thai place. I said, no, it's native. Let's go there. So um, I bought the Bannock and came home. I met Sharon from Kakuli. And when I came home, I talked to my friend Remy. And I said, oh my god, there's a native restaurant in Kelowna. We don't have one in Vancouver anymore. The Olympics are coming. The whole world is coming. We need a native restaurant here. This is crazy. And he's like, oh my god, I'll work day and night. Let's make it happen. I said, yeah, but I don't really feel that native yet. Like, I want it to be authentic. So we went to local nations and we started hiring local people. And uh, I went to Sharon at Kukuli and I asked her if she wanted to partner up with me. And originally she thought it would be a good idea and then she realized they were new as well and it wouldn't work with the distance and everything. So she said, I'll give you my blessings, I'll help you how you need it, but you're on your own. So. I opened Salmon and Bannock uh, during the 2010 Olympics, February 15th, 2010. And um, the culinary world in Vancouver didn't know me. The indigenous world didn't know me. So everybody thought I was culturally appropriating. Who's this person that opened this restaurant? Maybe I chose a nation just far enough away that nobody would ask questions. 
So they sent in spies. The New Hulk community sent in spies. And the one person came in and saw me and said, I don't think she's lying. She looks totally New Hulk. <laughs> so then they had to send in somebody older. <laughs> And um, she came in, you know, I thought when I opened this restaurant, I thought it was gonna be like open arms, come out of the cold, they're there, look at this, amazing. Like now we have a native restaurant, now we have Bannock, blah, blah, blah. Like I thought it was gonna be all like, you know, the warm and fuzzies. It wasn't, I had to prove myself. I had to prove myself to the indigenous community, I had to prove myself to the culinary world. And now I understand that and I respect that, but, um, this lady came in and she was a firing squad of questions and snapping them at me. And I thought, oh my God, she's so rude. Like, I can't believe this. And she asked me what my, I said, Look, honestly, the only thing I know is my biological mother's first name. So I told her, she got on the phone and I left. I went and got her her tea. And when I came back, I gave her her tea. She was on the phone, she hung up, she stood up and she extended her arms and she said, let me be the first to welcome you home. We're a family. And that was the day my life changed. Um, shortly after that, I think I got 50 Facebook requests from family and I was completely overwhelmed. And one thing I never knew is growing up white, I had no idea that I could have called New Hulk Nation and said, this is my name, who's my family? I never even thought about that. Like growing up in Vancouver, I'm not gonna call the mayor, who's my family? <laughs> You know, it doesn't make sense. So um, she made some phone calls and um, an uncle had been, he'd promised my late biological mother that he would find me. And he came in and he did a traditional blessing for the restaurant. And he looked at me and he said, your traditional name is gonna be Snitsmana. And I said, okay, and I had no idea what that meant. Shortly after that, he returned to Bella Coola and he passed away. And the chief of my family phoned me and said that there was gonna be a potlatch and um, I needed to be there to receive my traditional name. So um, 11, 11, 11, I went to Bella Coola uh, the first time as an adult and I met 500 relatives at a three day potlatch. I received my traditional name, my blanket, and it was the first time in my life that I felt good in my own skin. And now I'm a little bit annoying. I make jokes saying I'm a born again native. So <laughs> I can be a little bit annoying and right in your face about it. I'm super proud and I'm super proud to showcase um, everything indigenous. And um, so right now, um, here we are. I'm still learning every day about my culture, about my heritage. That was another thing. I thought everybody knew everything and I knew nothing. And I thought everybody knew their family and I knew nobody, but it's not the case. And I'm learning that day by day. We have really, really big families. <laughs> um, so the interesting thing was, is that I am taking people on a journey at my restaurant, but the journey I never knew was the journey within. And I think I recognize many of your faces and I think maybe you've been in and hopefully you had that experience that you came on that journey with me because it's really special. And one thing that Salmon and Bannock has done is it's built a community. Uh, Remy, my business partner, he left the business four years ago and I've been flying solo ever since. And um, when, the, when the pandemic hit, right when it hit, I was invited to speak at the SFU MBA, Indigenous MBA class, and I wasn't gonna go. I was in fetal position, you know, in a dark corner crying saying like, what am I gonna say? I'm a loser. I'm like going bankrupt. I've gotta like shut the doors. Like this is ridiculous. What am I gonna tell them? And I wiped away my tears and I showed up and I said, I'm just gonna be honest with you. Time, like it sucks. Like on the 10th anniversary, everything was amazing. We were on a really high, we were skyrocketing with the business. And like literally 10 minutes later, I was thinking about going bankrupt with the pandemic. And Sam and Abanik has built a community and the community has helped me believe in myself when I didn't, and I didn't think it was possible. Uh, the community came together, they bought gift certificates for the future, they loaned me money, they did as much as they could, and it's been an incredible, incredible learning curve. 
Um, Salmon and Bannock has never been a fast food restaurant. We've never done anything really fast. We don't own a microwave. Um, we put lots of time and love into everything. And when we were in lockdown, we were like, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to manage? So we had to come up with a brand aligned menu that would work for Uber Eats and the delivery platforms. And so we did, we came up with a brand aligned menu on Uber Eats and we kind of knocked it out of the park and, and people really enjoyed it and they really appreciated it. And then YVR comes knocking on the door and they want to have us open a location at YVR. Well, now we have two years of experience of fast food, which is perfect for YVR. So we're in the process. I've been working solidly for over a year on Salmon and Bannock on the Fly, which is going to be opening at YVR, um, hopefully at the end of next month. Um, it's extremely challenging opening at YVR. Uh, all the contractors, the architects, everybody has to have security clearance. And so there's very limited amount of people that I can hire. Um, the price has gone up 100% from originally um, discussed. And YVR keeps adding additional challenges such as everything has to be green by X, whatever date it is. So anybody new coming in, everything has to be completely green. So there's additional costs. There was already additional costs with the supply demands and the supply chain for everybody. And now with a monopoly of who I can hire, um, my condo's on the line, everything is, I'm all in. And um, during the pandemic, another thing that we did was we did a fundraiser, a national fundraiser, and it was you help us help others. And we raised money with indigenous restaurants and chefs across the country. We shared the money and we fed different organizations. And Salmon and Bannock fed 400 people. Um, we fed, uh, we partnered up with Helping Spirit Lodge. Um, they house women and children fleeing domestic violence. And now we're going to be working on another fundraiser of a similar sort to help bring Salmon and Bannock to new heights and give it wings at YVR. And we're going to be uh, launching that pretty soon, hoping that organizations and companies can donate and half of the funds will go helping us open up the location at YVR and the other half will help us feed organizations in Vancouver of their choice. So it's kind of, um, I like to say there's no problems, there's only solutions and it's really important to find the solutions. And I used to tell my team that you're allowed to cry for five minutes and you have to set your alarm. And when the five minutes goes off, then you, you've given enough attention to that and it's time to move on. So when the pandemic hit, I texted the girls that used to work with me and I said, how, how long do I have <laughs> on the alarm? <laughs> because yeah, there was, there's been a lot of tears. Um, but it's an exciting time. I'm excited to retire from Air Canada. I'm excited to open my second location. I've already been asked um, to open a third location. And I said, it's not a no, but it's an, just give me a minute. I need to open YVR and see how that gets going. Another thing with YVR is all of my team has to have their security clearance as well. And that could take up to six months. Um, my, my team at the Broadway location is all indigenous. And my first choice of hiring at YVR is indigenous, but I'm going to be hiring anybody that wants to come to work because I'm going to need a lot of staff and it's at international departures after the duty free. It's a licensed food court location. And um, the good thing is also with my airline experience, I understand what the passengers want. Um, I have a pretty good understanding of what they want. So that's an exciting venture that I'm getting into. Um, we are also looking at launching retail. Um, I brought six items to the lab and I have all the labeling ready to launch that. I just don't have the time or the team to execute that right at the moment, but that's something that's going to be happening as well. So that's super exciting, but thanks for listening to my story. Thanks for having me here. Haichika Stutsunits.
anybody have any questions for Inez or comments? <laughs> or applications? <laughs> Resumes? <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, Inez. And do we have any questions from Zoom? I haven't been told that we had any questions from Zoom today, so, okay. But if you do in the Zoom format, please let us know if you have any questions as we move through the agenda here. So thank you so much, Inez, for being with us and sharing your story um, about just your life journey and how you got to where you are. And I know that you'll continue to be successful in all the endeavors. I'm looking forward to the YVR location, to the retail location, to the third location, all of those. Um, and we will actually be calling Inez back up here uh, in a few minutes because our next panel is called The Business of Bannock, <laughs> Women in Cultural Enterprise. And um, I'm super excited about this panel as well um, because we have four Indigenous women entrepreneurs here, um, or five, I think, <laughs> uh, Indigenous women entrepreneurs here today to share their, their story of success. Um, and we've just met Inez Cook, heard about her story and the award-winning restaurant, Salmon and Bannock. Today, she'll be joined by Kelsey Coots, Destiny Husty, from, um, who are co-owners of Bang & Bannock, which is such a cool Bang & name. <laughs> and I just bought four packages. Um, in uh, their setup, so if you haven't visited their, uh, their vendor spot yet, um, I would suggest that you do that uh, before you leave over the next two days. Um, and so they'll be coming up for the panel, as well as Lynn Marie Angus, who's the CEO of Sisters Sage. Um, yay! And if you're not following Lynn on Instagram or any like social media, you need to uh, TikTok because she is like the most engaging um, Indigenous woman entrepreneur that I've seen online. So I'm uh, really happy that she's here, and I visited her vendor table as well at lunch. So if you haven't done that. It, I would suggest that you go and visit her as well before you leave over the next two days. So I don't want to take up any more of their time. If the panel wants to come up on stage um, right now, we have five chairs. So lots of room. Are we going to make a TikTok? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Is this on? I think there's a mic on your chair there. <laughs> awesome. So please join me in welcoming our Business of Bannock Women in Cultural Enterprise panel. Which side should we start from? Should we start over here? Should we start over here? Yeah, you can start. Look, you can see yourself in here. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Kelsey. I'm um, part co-founder of Bang & Bannock with my partner, Destiny. Um, we've been in business for just over a year now. We started with e-commerce um, because it was COVID time. So we are a COVID baby business. Um, yeah. What do you want to say, Destiny? Yeah, hi, I'm Destiny Husty. I'm a Cinnaboyne and Nakota on my mother's side from White Bear First Nations. And on my father's side, like Norwegian and German. Um, I'm like displaced indigenous person. I was raised here on the Coast Salish territories. Um, and I also want to honor the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil tooth nations that we are currently occupying right now and that I carry out our business. Um, yeah, so Banging Bannock, like Kelsey was saying, was 
we formulated last year, and we were actually in an indigenous youth entrepreneur program. Pandemic hit, we didn't know what we were gonna do. I had like a business idea that was, um, that I was thinking about, and so, of course, as I'm like having these conversations with my partner, but like wanting to start a business, this like little ad pops up on my Facebook and it's saying it's an indigenous entrepreneur program. So I was like, hey, I'm gonna sign up. I wanna learn. Because um, prior to COVID, I was studying for my bachelor's of social work at MBIT, which is an indigenous institution here. And so all of my plans were put on hold. So I could no longer then do my practicum placement because we were all on lockdown. And I was just, and then I also was about to give birth to my third baby. So I was just like, okay, um, plans are changing a bit, things are shifting. And yeah, so we joined this program. It's called the three, what is it? BC3C. Yeah, B, BC3C. BC3C. Um, and it was actually funded by the BC. Um, what is it, the BC Assembly of First Nations, which is also hosting this program, so, or this conference, so that was, it's quite cool to do the full circle and actually be welcomed here to speak. Um, yeah, so during that program, it was a 45-day challenge that you were given a microloan, you were given mentorship, and you were also partnered up, and it was all virtual. So me and Kelsey were partnered up as strangers, didn't know each other, um, and you got, yeah, to start a business. And it was just kind of like a little project in the beginning. We're like, okay, let's do Bannock. We both have like a passion for Bannock. We love Bannock. We come from big families. Bannock was just something that was always in our family, something that we loved. And we're like, how can we do this e-commerce style? So we were like, okay, let's throw it in a bag, start selling it online. And that's kind of how our business started. Um, we just upgraded our bags. Um, do you want to talk about the bags or you want to add? Sure, yeah. Cool. She added so much more information. I'm just like, yeah, we're here. We're a baby business. Hi. She's like, she's got all the good information in there. So we did just get our retail bags ready. Um, we are the first Western Canada bagged bannock business in retail, um, which is pretty dang exciting. Um, we've got a really big focus on community and revitalization of culture, so we scrapped the French on our bags. Um, Destiny and I, neither of us are French. So we scrapped the French, we've got Cree on there. We both have a uh, Cree lineage in our family. My father's Nikosli, so that's, that's the lineage that I, that I identify with the most, um, but my grandfather's family was all Cree. So we chose Plains Cree. Um, we've got lots of language. We've got a whole bunch of, like a slew of different nations on the bag because we really wanted to represent that we're all very diverse and there's a lot of different nations. There's, it's not pan-indigenous. There's not, there's not one of us, right? We don't all have totem poles and live in teepees. That's just not how it goes. We really wanted to re represent that um, in our packaging. So that's where we are with our retail bags. We're pretty excited about it. We're being uh, approached by some bigger retail places across Canada to get on the shelf. So we're pretty excited to be popping up and getting in those places soon. Um, that's probably all I can think of about the bags. I didn't really add a whole lot about myself. My name's Kelsey, I did add that. Um, I grew up on Vancouver Island in Nanus Bay, which is just outside of Nanaimo. Uh, I was born in Campbell River. My dad's side is Nakazli, so outside of Fort St. James on uh, Fraser Lake. And my mom is Irish Scottish, so Bannock is kind of a cool one for me because Bannock is originally a Scottish Gaelic word that would have come over with some of the original trappers. Um, and our bannock is a resilience food and really, really shows that, that kind of interesting um, combo that we've got going on here in Canada. We definitely have some interesting splits going on. So, um, yeah, we chose bannock because it's very, very special to both of us. I have six little sisters. Destiny has also six siblings. Yeah, so we're both from families of seven siblings, so you can imagine that feeding that many kids in a household, you're, <laughs> uh, you know, it, <laughs> we're, not, we're not all getting croissants. It's, it's going to be something a little different. So we did have a lot of Bannock growing up, Bannock at almost every meal, Bannock at every family gathering. Um, 
We have our own family recipes. Our, our Bannock recipe is designed from um, my grandmother and my, my mother's recipe, which came from uh, Yale, actually, from when I was growing up just outside of Hope. Someone taught her Bannock there. So my mom's recipe and my grandma's recipe and then Destiny's recipe from her family, but there's there is no measurements with Bannock. Anyone who grew up with Bannock knows it's like a handful of this, a pinch of that. Like you don't, it's really hard to kind of pinpoint down. So we really wanted to make a consistent recipe um, from something that means so much to us. Uh, and I think I think we managed to do it. It's pretty consistent. It's really delicious. It's fluffy. No negative reviews yet. So yeah. That's our story. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like, your turn. <laughs> oh, I just love hearing about you guys. I love you so much. We oh, love you. Are you all like indigenous women entrepreneurs? You're just like, ooh, I just could sit here and listen all day. Like, this whole panel, I love you all. Oh, yeah. Me too. Yeah. So, and it's funny being invited here because it's like, makes Bannock, makes Bannock, eats Bannock. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Hey, we get <laughs> sticky hands. We need your soap, okay? They like they go hand. In hand. I see the connections. All good. <laughs> <laughs> um, hello, Waiwa, and Dawala Wan, Samoyget, Samigat, Sigidim Hanak, Lin Marie Angus, Ada Kuat Bam Yao De Wayu, Lachibu De Wabadegu, Get Gatla. Ada Nishka, Kri, Ada Meti De Wawatku. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Lynn Marie Angus. My traditional name is Kuit Bam Yao. Um, I come from the Lakibu clan, and I am Get Gatla, Nishka, Kri, and Meti. And I'm a little bit nervous because oftentimes, like, I, I just introduce myself in my, my father's language, Somalia. And oftentimes, when I do that, people don't know the language, so they don't know if I'm making a mistake. But my brother, my dad's brother- Are you gonna eat some? Like, oh, no. I'm so nervous, because he's there. Like, no. <laughs> don't I, come um, for me afterwards. <laughs> it's but really good. It's really important for you know, the younger generations to learn our language and just to use it, even if you are making mistakes. The, the lessons that I were taught and have learned is that that's, the, that's how the ancestors, ancestors can hear you, they understand, and they know that you're, you're making an effort and you're trying. So even if I am, you know, come at, come at me afterwards and teach me if I said it wrong and, get, and how do I make that sound more proper? <laughs> um, so anyways, back to myself. My name is Lynn Marie Angus. Um, I am the owner and uh, CEO, thanks for that. <laughs> I love that, and CEO of Sister Sage. Um, and Sister Sage is an indigenous wellness brand. Um, what we do is uh, use our cultural knowledge and ingredients and medicines to create modern, uh, modern self-care and wellness products. Um, and you can see me at the table over there, so come see me afterwards, buy my stuff. I make soap, uh, bath bombs, smokeless smudge sprays, liquid hand soap, what else, salve. Um, and so we, my sister and I started this business in September 2018. We are local, we're e from East Van, um, women-owned, indigenous-owned, small business, still an at-home business. And in our short, what, three and a half years, which we have done, like, ran our business mostly through a pandemic. And I liked, what did you say, like, a, a pandemic, what did you say, a baby pandemic? COVID baby? business. COVID business, <laughs> yeah, and, like, pandemic. that's kind of what, what we are. Um, but it turns out people need soap in a pandemic, so. Um, <laughs> that we do. I mean, like, <laughs> I'm not trying that to be do. like a c catastrophe, like, <laughs> but it just turns out people need soap, anyways. Um, so we started in 2018, and we grew the business like so quickly um, that in our short three years, I'm just gonna like throw some stuff out at you. We won, I am the first national powwow pitch winner which was crazy because, uh, you know, just even this is a little bit crazy, but like talking in front of people and pitching my business. Um, that, so we won Pow Wow Pitch. Um, I'm also the uh, current Indigenous Business of the Year, um, honored through BC Achievement Awards um, in November of last year. And also small business, oh, thank you. <laughs> wait, 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 there's more. <laughs> I'm also Small Business BC honored us with the uh, best community impact. So. Mm. Um, I've just been out there hustling hard. 
Um, so yeah, come and, come and see me and come buy my stuff afterwards. But I guess, I mean, you guys shared a lot, so I'll share a little bit about my history with Sister Sage. Um, even before Sister Sage, I was working in construction, which was like, it was not very fun for indigenous women. And I was like, I can change this from the inside out and I can be like that, that powerful woman for indigenous, uh, that powerful role model for indigenous women. But it turns out I was diagnosed with PTSD and major depressive disorder stemming from incidents at, can, like can, from white men in construction, to put it bluntly. Um, so at, that was just something that really like forced me into like I need to do something for myself. I need to become an entrepreneur. I need to do it. Do some. I didn't even. I was like, what kind of skills do I have that's marketable? Um, so my sister and I back and forth, back and forth. Like, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? We knew it had to be indigenous, and we knew it had to promote our own growth in like every aspect of our lives, spiritually, culturally, community. Um, and so we, we landed, like my sister was already like interested in doing bath bombs. I'm like, hey, let's, let's do that. I, I like soap, let's run with that. We started the business. I didn't even make, I hadn't made a single bar of soap yet at that moment. But I was like, I have a dream and I'm, gonna, I'm going with this. I don't, I wanna just 180 from what I was doing mm -hmm. and be successful. And so I was like, there's no, there's no failure, there's no choice. I have to do this. And so I enrolled myself into a community entrepreneur program, um, ran through Solder School of Business and at the end of that program, this is 2018, and at the end of that program, um, I had to give my very, very first pitch before Pow Wow Pitch, and I, um, I won $200, and with that $200, I, st I started Sister Sage. We went and we bought supplies, and we have been reinvesting ever since then. We're a bootstrap business, only up until recently when I received a little bit of um, funding from a sh the CEO community, but, I mean, it's been a lot of work and a lot of like, especially through like a pandemic, it was a lot of me in my basement wearing all of the hats um, in business and like to, to run a business. And so I'm sure you ladies understand, right? So it's, it's, it's been difficult. So now that we're growing and expanding, I was able to get out of my basement because those soap walls were closing in on me and I got out of the basement, got into a new home and we're still an at-home business, but we have more room now. Um, and we're just growing. And so basically we're just, we have the next step for Sister Sage is, um, you know, a shop or a storefront or a warehouse or manufacturing. Like we just want to grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger. At this moment, Sister Sage is a six figure business. And what we do is um, sell online through Shopify. And we do like vending opportunities like this, powwows. Um, and that, you know, of course, was all taken away through the pandemic. But now that it's coming back, I'm like, I'm ready. I'm ready to go back into community because that's where I think that we do our best work. And it's not just about raising our bank account, but it's also about raising our community. And I think that's why we were honored with best community impact through Small Business BC is because we do so much give back to our community because I feel like self-care is community care. You know, and that's in my, I'm not, I don't even want to say my opinion. That's, that's, it's truth. It's like, that's what we were all brought up in our potlatch culture, that we take care of our own. And we take care of our community because they will take care of us in the end. Um, yeah, so I think a, another really important part for, a important mission of Sister Sage is to support and mentor and uh, motivate other Indigenous women to also define their own financial futures through indigenous business because in our opinion this is our our take back this is our own economic reconciliation we being the true and original entrepreneurs of turtle island of these lands that you know we all know our history that it was taken from us it's time to reclaim that and i'm here to help others mm -hmm. um, do that and so some of the things that i do is like with banging bionic I was just going to say, we can attest to that. Yeah, the the amount true. of support that Sister Sage has given us from the very beginning has just made us feel really like there was a community already here waiting for us. There, like we, um, we weren't afraid to ask the big questions and kind of get in with two feet because we knew that there was, there was a community um, behind us who have been through it before and is willing to help us grow. And we really, really, like she inspires us to want to do the same thing. As we grow, we really, really, really want to, to mentor and give back like, like Sister Sage has. Like she's been, can't even describe it. 
good role model. Oh, stop. <laughs> He's so sweet. But you know what? I had those people ahead of me, like Inez, right, who did the exact same thing for me. Who She sells, she actually, in her restaurant, she uses Sister Sage um, soap in her bathroom. And she sells my products in her shop. And so... Uh, and she mentors me. And so it's just like this, you know, it's our own little circular economy of we're all just like helping each other. And we're, you know, I said, we're not just all trying to raise our bank account, we're trying to raise up a community and each other. And so this like indigenous sisterhood that we've created is that's like, that's how I can measure my impact and my success as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Mic drop. <laughs> you can start to see the decolonization of business just here and there in it's little coming. places. Like, yeah, it's really inspiring and exciting. It's really exciting. Yeah, it's coming, definitely. Um, you didn't get to talk. I know you talked a lot earlier. I talked a lot earlier. People are <laughs> sick of me. <laughs> I don't know. I think I'm done with Sister Sage chat, but it, does anyone have questions, comments? Lynn Marie, are you talking to me? Yeah, Lynn Marie. Inez. Inez. <laughs> how, um, how would you say that, what, what advice would you give to young entre native entrepreneurs that are trying to start up a business of their own? I think it depends on what kind of business. Mm -hmm. um, these ladies here, they've already got their retail nailed, which is amazing. I'm just going to be dipping my toes into that soon. So I, my advice to everyone is always um, find somebody that you admire that is doing something well and ask them questions. Ask them if they can mentor you. Um, people are usually really honored to help out and to answer if they can. Um, if I can ever help people um, learn from the mistakes I made, um, it's always, you know, it makes me feel great if I can help somebody with that. Um, my big thing when I do talks is uh, something I learned after opening the business was company culture and how important that is. And that's usually the first thing that I really, really like to hammer in. I wish that had been really um, explained to me really well before I opened my business. Um, it's been pretty challenging. Another thing is, is that it depends also on location. Um, if people are opening up in small communities, a lot of times they hire their family and their friends, and that's not always the best way to go. Um, and it's really hard finding that happy medium and that, that line between family and friends and business. And um, so those things I find really important. Um, right from the beginning, before opening a business, and really having um, everything laid out. Like right now for YVR, um, it's a new venture, and it's um, scaling up to levels we've never done before. Um, at broad, the Broadway location, we have 30 seats. I mean, we've done catering for 200 people, but that was pre-purchased, and we knew what we'd be serving, and that's completely different when they're expecting, you know, tens of thousands, you know, 50,000 passengers passing by one day, you know. Um, you know, we're still going in green on this, trying to understand how we're going to scale up. And I'm building my solid core team right now that we're all in this, literally diving in together. And, and so I think just, you know, get the right people on your team and and as long as they have the same vision and you know they're in the same boat as you and heading in the same direction i think that's really 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 important uh, hi there mosi cho for the uh, presentation it's very touching um my name is caleb ben machadan daiza mosi cho to the host nations of I'm the director of rights of the fn but i want to ask a specific question I'll read from Article 31 of the UN Declaration where it states uh, at Article 31, indigenous peoples have the right to maintain, control, protect, and develop their intellectual property over such cultural heritage, traditional knowledge, and traditional cultural expressions. And further, um, states have, shall take effective measures to recognize and protect the exercise of these rights. And I'm thinking about, it's a two-part question, 
how do you protect your intellectual property relative to the colonial government? Because you're creators and you're, and you're doing things that are like very interesting, like your business models, your approach. So that's one part of the question. But the other part of the question is, how do you maintain right relations in your businesses relative to your own laws? Like Inez, you were talking about coming home and getting your name and, and that relationality to the local community and the endeavors that it seems that you all are doing relative to the community and how that community supports you. But I just wonder, like, in the business process, especially for small businesses, um, how do you protect your intellectual property? And, and how does that relationship work? Because like, it's very special and unique, like not only relative to the government and other competitors, but also to our own people and communities. Uh, Masicho. Um, well, I'll start on this one. Uh, when I, after I opened, there was um, this cute little Mennonite pastor and his wife that came in to see me and she was wearing a bonnet okay like I swear to god they left their horse outside and they were super cute and like I said I'm 60 scoop my mom's Mennonite I grew up you know um with knowing about Mennonites and um so I thought this this cute little pastor and his wife, and they're like, oh dear, how did you come up with the name? And how did you do this? And how did you do that? So I sat with them and I said, well, I, I wanted salmon in the name so um, people would know that it was a West Coast restaurant. And I put Bannock in the name so Indigenous people would know that this is their place. So if they couldn't remember what one of the words was they go oh it was salmon and something or it was something in bannock so that's how i came up with the name salmon and bannock and they said oh why don't you say salmon and bannock and i said like honestly because i don't want to sound uptight i just want it to roll off the tongue i just want it salmon and bannock i just want it like that like literally like three months later they opened up tea and bannock in toronto like freaking livid, 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 livid. People are like, oh, well, when, when people are uh, imitating you, that's a compliment. Well, it didn't, it still actually doesn't feel like a compliment. It still makes me like my blood boil and makes me livid. And now, you know, the Food Network called and, and was um, posting about the best indigenous restaurants in the country and um, wanted me on this list including T and Bannock. And I said, they're not indigenous. I'm not going on the list. Remove my name from the list. I'm not going to be on the list. So they removed T and Bannock's name from the list, which is, I was grateful about that. I said, okay, now you can put my name back on the list. But yeah, um, it was in the Globe and Mail. And they said, how do you feel about, you know, native restaurants, Aboriginal restaurants opening up all across the country? I said, it's, it's amazing. You know, we should be everywhere. There should be every kind. There should be, you know, casual cafes, high-end restaurants. It should just be like, you're going for sushi, you're going for indigenous. Like, it should just be mm -hmm. that much. It should be that common. Like, you go to Greek town and there's 20 Greek restaurants side by side and they're all busy. People want to try different things and try, you know, different viewpoints and it's amazing. But then they said, and how do you feel about tea and bannock? And I said, well, they're not indigenous. They said, well, they serve bologna. <laughs> and I was like seething at this point. And, you know, I said, bologna is not an indigenous food. And I, yeah, absolutely livid. It still makes me absolutely fuming livid. So um, that's a really good question. I don't know how to. You know, I, I can't own the name Salmon. I can't own the name Bannock. <laughs> and I just have to, that's the other thing. Now people have come into the restaurant and they think T and Bannock is like T dot for Toronto. They think it's like an extension of mine and we're the, the West Coast one. And it just makes, I, so every single chance I get, I tell people. <laughs> I love this story. <laughs> yeah, that's a I mean, a terrible story, but um, this, so and as is right, it's like this is it's a it's such a deeper topic. It's a, the subject. It's not just like how do, like how do you deal with it? There's not like a list of rules on how you can deal with cultural appropriation because cultural appropriation happens 
everywhere, all over the place, every day, but it doesn't just happen from like non-indigenous business towards an indigenous, you know, uh, cultural or intellectual property. It's also <clears throat> happening laterally between our own cultures. And so that's a, a, an issue that I've been dealing with recently too. It's like, you know, how can you say I'm a, um, a Mi'kmaq woman and I'm using cultural property from the Northwest coast? Like that's, I mean, that's still cultural appropriation. And the only way that I can see to handle it at this moment, because what, in the United States, there are laws that you, you know, you have to actually be of um, a certain nation to be using uh, whatever cultural properties or, or consider yourself an indigenous business. They, we don't have that here in Canada. So it's very hard to like, how, number one, like how do you vet an indigenous business without just like, you're coming out and like, like call out culture, right? So how do you do that and without offending somebody? And so you, I, what I've done is like gone personally or privately and spoken to people and like, hey, can you locate yourself? Like how we all did when we sat up here and spoke to you all and we said, this is our family name. This is where we're from. This is where my family's from. And so that's not something that should be offensive to, because this is part of our, our culture. This is what we do. We locate ourselves to one another. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand like 60 scoop, uh, scoopies, like my friend Inez here, it's, it's difficult. And so there's a lot of sympathy. So there's a lot of like sh um, gray area where, you, where how, what can you touch and what, what are, like without, offending somebody else. So at this moment, I don't think there is like a, a set in stone, like how do I deal with cultural appropriation? Um, <clears throat> but we're trying. <laughs> um, and so I think that it's, it's really important for us as indigenous people to, to talk about this, to vet, try attempt to vet the businesses that we're supporting and um, share about this knowledge and how it, uh, it, it literally hurts and harms indigenous people and indigenous uh, persons and our attempt at um, you know, people for generations have been profiting off of our own cultural and intellectual properties, but it's, it's our turn. This is our inherent right, and this is, like I said earlier, about us being the original entrepreneurs. We should have the ability to, to profit off of our own properties. Um, and so it's time that it stopped. So I don't have any cut, like, yeah, quick answers to this, mm -hmm. to that question. But hopefully that um, sparked some things in your brain. Mm -hmm. Ladies? Yeah. It's um, a hard one. I was just going to say, like, I, I don't feel like, like. It needs to be. I don't know. Well, we don't, we don't really have a sense of, of ownership. Like, I kind of feel like Bang & Bannock owns us, <laughs> if anything. Mm -hmm. um, it's got a life of its own. But, like, as far as, like, Bannock, like, you can't, you, every, every family has their own recipe. You can't, yeah. you can't claim to own Bannock. That's something that we, we have the opportunity to share our family recipes with other people. Um, but it's not really something that can, can necessarily be protected because it belongs to all of us. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not ours to protect. And, and we don't, you know, we're not Pepsi. We don't want to, like, <laughs> lock it down and, and not share with everyone else. We... Um, we want it to support everyone. So, I mean, like, it might be a mistake at this point, but we haven't put a whole lot into protecting our intellectual property because I, I just don't feel like it's something that we can own. It's something that we have the opportunity to share. And, uh, and that's what we're focusing on. Yeah, I think we can really focus on, like, reclaiming and taking up space. Like, if you look at our packaging, we've used Indigenous languages because that is something that we are trying to reclaim and knowing that our languages are dying out like we are trying to take up that space and like for example like right now we have Cree on our packaging and on our next pro project I want to put N Nakota language on there but it's so unfortunate that there aren't that much um, translators I've been able to contact one Nakota translator and he is swamped with projects so just a shout out if anyone knows any Nakota translators, <laughs> I'm looking for one. Um, and just trying to reclaim that is I think the best that I can really do. I'm, it's very hard, like I feel like we're all kind of struggling with um, protecting things. I mean, we can all stand together and um, have those conversations, but I really feel like the approach that, I kind of want to shift away from like ownership because as we were, putting on, as we were getting the translation for Cree on our packaging, one of the words 
that we wanted translated was Banging Bannock is an indigenous women owned business. And the Cree translator came to us and was like, I don't, we can't translate the word ownership. It's, um, that's not a traditional concept to us. And we, so I forget what he put in there, but I don't think it, it translates exactly to ownership. And yeah, because that wasn't a concept back then. And so that was just kind of eye opening. Cause if you look now, everything's owned. You own property, you own vehicles, you own, like everything's we ownership. Think we do. Yeah, and that was just, it's so beautiful when you do connect and learn the concepts of indigenous languages. And I think it's so important to be reclaiming certain things, even if you can't speak the language fluently, if you can't, like just to learn those concepts because there's so Word much connection. Day. Yeah, and that's, so that's, that's a good question you're asking. It's a hard question for us to answer, um, but I'm, I'm all about reclaiming. Yeah, that was a great yeah. question. That was a great question. We need a Nakota translator. <laughs> Anybody on Zoom, email us, eatbannock at gmail. <laughs> So uh, speaking of Zoom, um, we do have a question from Lorelai Phillips, and this is for everybody on the panel, so you can all, I'll show your ups and downs. Looking back over your business journeys, what was the lesson that was crucial for your success? And I know you're all going to have fabulous answers. Oh, <laughs> uh, I know this. <clears throat> This is a hard one because if we, I'm sure we all get asked this question like so many times mm -hmm. and it just, it changes often. Um, this sounds so like silly, but I'm like self-care, mm -hmm. right? Um, like I said earlier, it's like I don't really subscribe to like that, uh, that colonial idea of like I gotta raise my bank account, I have to raise my, I'm trying to raise my community. Mm -hmm. And so by, like, it's like, like back, back to the self-care and you know if I can't, if. I'm not, I don't want to be hypocritical and sell self-care if I'm not actually caring for myself. And so um, a big part of my <clears throat> success is like it, interweaving the idea of self-care within my business um, because I've learned through ceremony that it's, if I can't care for myself first, then I cannot care for anybody else. Um, and when I said this sounds silly, that doesn't sound silly. Now that I've said it, I'm like, actually that sounds like so poignant. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Um, it's interesting that people look at me and think I'm successful and I'm like, ooh, what does successful mean? Mm -hmm. And when will I be successful? Um, I think a lot of times as an entrepreneur, you feel like a fraud. You wake up and you feel like a fraud. And it's funny when I heard that expression, you know, oh, I'm going to quit my, my nine to five so I can work 24 <laughs> seven. <laughs> True. <laughs> and, uh, you know, several, several years in, I haven't taken a salary. Um, I was about to take a salary two years ago, and then the pandemic hit, and I preferred to keep my staff employed, so I didn't take a salary. I'm going to start taking a salary once I retire from Air Canada, but um, I think that um, just... One of the entrepreneur courses that I took, they said, um, in order to be successful, you need to work for your business, not in it. And that didn't make sense to me for a really, really long time. But it goes back to uh, bringing the right team members on your team. And I'm expanding my team and my management team. And all of a sudden, life is getting so much brighter and, and more exciting because more of us to do the jobs needed and the task needed to be done. And it feels like we're on the right path uh, for success, absolutely. Um, I will say one learning thing, I wanted to share this story, is when we opened the restaurant, we were completely green in catering and different things like that. And we were hired to do a big catering for the chiefs. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, originally they said that they were gonna have it at the Holiday Inn, and we just had to drop it off, sign a disclaimer. They were going to heat it and serve it for the guests. But the, the keynote speaker had fallen ill, so they had to postpone the event. So we said, OK, sure, no problem. And then a few months later, they said, OK, we have the event. Um, and we just had to change venues. The Holiday Inn was no longer available. We said, OK, great. 
we signed on the dotted line and we got to the Museum of Vancouver and they gave us a coat room for the event to cater from. And we had <laughs> rented the 100 cup coffee maker and there was no working electricity on the main floor where we were. And there was, people were livid, 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 so angry with us. And it was a huge learning curve and it was an important learning curve um, you know, learning about our business and, and being the, the, the experts of our business and learning to ask the right questions. And, and that was, you know, it was so humiliating at the time, but I'm actually grateful that happened because it did teach us a lot of lessons to get us to where we are now. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a really big successful thing, like what I try to tell people all the time is, is really believe what you're doing and love what you're doing. If you, if you really truly love what you're doing, then it feels a lot, a lot different than, than grinding to the bone. Like it's, it's still tons of work. Like you don't sleep, you're, you're, you know, covered in emails, and just when you think you're like seeing the top of it, more emails come in. Like it's, it really is never ending. But when it's something you really care about, and you can really see differences being made in the community, or or you can, you know, the more you grow, like we give 10% of our profits back every month. So the more that we grow, we can watch those donations get bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's things like that that are really exciting for us. And I think it's things like that that have made our last year relatively successful is because we, we, we literally love what we do. Like we love what we do. My, my other um, daytime job is actually setting up this room. I didn't do this one, but I'm normally the person plugging in the speakers and taping down those, uh, the cords on the ground. So it's a totally, totally different different realm and I, I like that too, but um, it, doesn't, it doesn't really compare to something that you really feel like embodies everything that you care about. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, successes, oh boy. Um, I feel like there's so many of them and they happen all, of the t all of the time. But one of my favorite one is just my children. Like my daughter comes to me, like I'll be getting ready for just going to a vendor and my daughter comes to me like wanting to bake cookies and start selling cookies with me and it's just like her brain is shifting to like you know being an entrepreneur and that is just so inspiring to see like my children looking up to me and just being that person for them that's one of my favorite ones is yeah and just like we do donate 10 percent each month and our next project that we're working on is we want to do a startup grant for a business and like I guess we'll continuously do that as our, our donations grow but we want to be able to mentor. Mentor is a huge one for us too. I feel like we have a whole year of knowledge of walking this path and being able to share that with somebody else who wants to take this journey too. I feel like we would save them a whole lot of time and just be that support in that community for them. So that's one of the big things um, that we're looking forward to doing too. And I'm so excited to be launching that pretty quick. Yeah, community is yeah. huge. Yeah. Community is huge to success for sure. Yeah. Right. This was such a great discussion. Yeah, this is a really good discussion. I feel what else I feel we got? Who, who else wants to know some things? All <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> Three more questions. All right. Come at us. There we go. <laughs> 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 Take one for the team. Um, thank you for your stories. You're very inspiring. Thank you for your stories. You're very inspiring. I've got a question about language because I too love language. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think there's legislation in Canada that says you have to have French on packaging. You once do. You go to that Ooh. next level. <laughs> so are you fighting that? Or? That's, we, we're we, so ready to fight it. No are. one's tried to fight us yet. All we want to do is fight about it, but no one's come at us. 
We're like, come on, there's no French on the packaging. Did you notice? And they're like, yeah, so can we get a couple cases? Yeah. Like, and we are yeah, but there's to- no French on the package. <laughs> Did you notice? Yeah. We are starting to pro- approach big, uh, bigger retails. So, yeah, we are definitely waiting for that. We're ready to fight. We, ready awesome. to fight. And you know yeah. what? We want there to be a change. We want to see more Indigenous languages on packaging. We want to this- have a conversation about it. We want them to, to bring it up and, and yeah. you know, have the opportunity for us to be like, yeah, but... You're like, I got a lot of aunties and cousins. Bring it. <laughs> you need to get the whole nation after you guys. Yes, no, you're 100% right. It is, it is legal. Yeah. Uh, legally in Canada, we're supposed to have the French and the English displayed on the package. We just don't want to do it. <laughs> Disrupting that whole thing. I'm going to be selling my retail products at YVR, and it has to be in English and French. Um, yeah. And at YVR, I, like, it would be so hard to have that fight. There's so many rules. It would be so hard to have that fight. Yeah. So good job, ladies. Hari Masai Cho. Sai Luruldale from the Lake Babi Nation. Um, Hunzu, um, congratulations on your business. It's uh, very well done. I'm looking for a website for that sisterhood retail info, what we went through, everything that you just discussed. Something where I can plot myself in Google and Google any one of your names and then a business of economic development hurdles, repercussions, loopholes, like the language culture right there. How I could reach out to support your soap and your bannock. How do I get to you in Northern British Columbia when you're down here? How do I create a fan base for you to go to the Broadway and say, hey, there's Bannock down there. YVR, great big industry. Thank you, YVR, for actually taking UNDRIP seriously and including Indigenous um, vendors in their huge manufacturing business. So I'm looking for a spot, that go-to button. Masai Cho. Yeah, we need one of those, hey? Like a well, I think there's some smarty pants in this room that could do that. <laughs> the, the thing, the, there's, of course, I'm like, I want to call my friend up here to talk about it, but there are some issues with doing like this. It Come on up, Tracy. When I was talking about cultural appropriation and how do you vet an indigenous business, too? And then how, you know, on that list of businesses, then how do those, like, you know, uh, vendors who are making like missing and murdered indigenous women t-shirts from Vietnam slip in there without being, you know, do you understand what I mean? Like it's just, there's just so many ins and outs of that, but you can go, I mean, right now there's like, like on Facebook, there's indigenous women's shops that you can go and it's everything that you said, it's not all encompassing that, which I think would be amazing. Like the tips and tricks and uh, hits and misses. Um, of, of all of our experiences, I think that would be really great. But Tracy, do you want to come up here and talk about it? <laughs> yeah, come Tell on, come us on, come about on. it. So Tracy. this is uh, this is Tracy. She's here. I'll let you introduce yourself. Is this thing on? Yeah. We love Tracy. Yay! Yay. Hi everyone. <laughs> My name is Tracy. I'm Chum Chan from the Kitsum Kalem First Nation. Born and raised there, and now I live in New West on the Kikite First Nation. Um, I'm the uh, Build Native partner and operations manager at Shopify. And we're an indigenous-led, indigenous-built team. Um, We focus on creating culturally appropriate and authentic education for indigenous businesses. Um, Because it's needed in every aspect of indigenous business, we're finding it's completely different from marketing to, you know, community building, everything. So, Uh, Anybody that works with us, we have an online community. Um, Right now we have about 300 entrepreneurs in our Slack community where we want to foster a really organic relationship between everybody so you can leverage everybody's experience. Uh, Some of the merchants have been with us for 15 years. Some of them are brand new baby businesses. Um, We partner with people like Google, Facebook, TikTok, and we really push them to change their products and their platforms to make it more applicable for us. Um, And I get to work with I've worked with all four of these amazing women. Uh, They make my job quite easy. Um, What was the question? Now I'm all nervous. (laughs) (laughs) We we need like a a home base for indigenous women entrepreneurs to uh, share our experiences. Yeah, I mean, 
I think we're trying to build something like that, but it's like there's, it needs to be open to more than just people who are at Shopify, obviously. Um, I think that there's a, the Facebook website is really good, but we're building a um, like an online directory of businesses that's going to be a bit more interactive than just a list. I think ISK has one that's gross. Um, you got to fill out like all these attributes, and it's really hard to use. But we want to do one that's uh, it's, there's a website right now, it's called Empowered by Shopify, and that's a list of black businesses and Asian-owned businesses, um, and that's going to include indigenous businesses soon. You can go to the Shop app, it's a, a Shopify product, um, and we have an indigenous list in there as well. And those are all businesses um, that we have, I don't want to say vetted, because that's gross, but you know, like we ask people where they're from, which community claims you. Um, and so we, we, we really pride ourselves on like what we're building and making sure that it's authentic. And if anybody wants to talk about e-commerce, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that people have. Thank you. Wait, Hanikte. My name, hi, how are you? My name's Mel. I'm from the Chilcotin Nation. My healer name is Aisha. And I was just wondering, um, what were some of the hurdles and challenges of opening an indigenous business that you guys have overcome? Open, open-ended question. Um, uh, I'll go. This, this is another one of those questions that I get asked like every single time. And every single time I would always say uh, access to capital. But most recently, I've been, I've been going through a lot of experiences and I've realized that there's a lot of other different barriers that we as Indigenous people in general experience, and that's intergenerational traumas. Um, and so most recently, I lost uh, someone really close to me. Um, and, you know, at the, the very stem of it, it was because he was traumatized, right? And so what we have to do to, like, we don't just have the opportunity to get up and run our business day in and day out. We have more as Indigenous people to take care of, like, caring for family members who are ill or addicted or sick or lost. Um, and there's just so much more to just running a business, especially, like, an at-home business. I, you know, I, I don't often spend, like, the 16 hours a day working on my business anymore because I have to care for my family who... Um, need to get to doctors or need uh, groceries, Th things like that. So I've realized that it's not just about access to capital and all of the like the the, ch the checklist of the barriers what we what people in general as entrepreneurs experience, but it's it's really it's our, our traumas. Um, so yeah, that's something to think about. For me, my Broadway location is an all Indigenous team, and my hiring pool is much smaller, and it's hard to. Um, expect people to move from small communities to an expensive city and and to live here and so that's really challenging so housing housing could be a barrier yeah exactly I have to agree with um, with Lynn's sentiment on the intergenerational trauma and carrying that with you um, I hadn't really thought about that before, to be honest, how there is all those extra steps in there that um, I guess other people probably wouldn't have experienced or wouldn't have come from, so just isn't a part that they're carrying with them through their business. Uh, that's, yeah, that's really interesting. That just, that just got my brain thinking well, there. Well, like I said it's earlier, like, it's like I always said these other things that were barriers until recently, I was like, no, it's not. Yeah. This is this is what our like largest barrier is is our traumas, our collective traumas. Yeah, I absolutely have to agree with you. I'm I'm gonna second your answer there. I was gonna say that I, I just like for myself, like um, maybe not so much a barrier, but a cautiousness is trying to make sure that we're always doing um, being the best representation that we can be, being a, as authentic as we can be. Um, teaching to the highest level that we can, um, yeah. giving back as much as possible. I, I mean, like one, one of the barriers for sure is, and again, it comes back to the intergenerational trauma and all the histories and stuff is um, explaining everything that you do. <laughs> like you, you would anticipate that people kind of understand your mindset, but you have to explain a lot all the time yeah. and it's just like this is just life but no you, you kind of have to explain every step from the very beginning quite intimately sometimes when you don't want to 
So that, um, yeah, interesting thoughts. Thanks for saying that one. That's. Yeah, I feel like, like maybe like decolonizing that colonial mindset of capitalism is a huge one. Um, just like small things like, we were talking to somebody about wanting to get office space or like warehouse space on indigenous land and people are like, oh, it's gonna be so expensive to go to North Van and like, why don't you just get a cheaper one over here? And it's just like, well, I want those partnerships with indigenous nations. I want that money to be going back into indigenous communities and stuff like that. And trying to explain to them that it's not all about the capital and like, there's always that mindset of money, 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 mass produced money, money, money. And I'm just like trying to decolonize that frame set and like what's best for my community. Sure, we can use packaging that is plastic, but no, I'm going to spend the extra money and get biodegradable because I'm going to think of like our future generations. And people will advise you to go for the cheaper option, but it's so capitalistic in that sense. And I feel like just really trying to have those conversations and kind of really understand your values and yeah like Kelsey said you're gonna have to keep explaining your values and explaining where you want to go and why you want to go that way it's like a language barrier all the time <laughs> they're like what you don't want to make more money community <laughs> say it with me <laughs> I actually um I see a lot of like common themes I do a lot of onboarding um, lots of groups of women, so like Indigenous people are creating businesses nine times the rate of uh, non-Indigenous Canadians, the percentage, majority of those being women, um, and it's phenomenal. Uh, but, I, you know, I have groups of 47 women sometimes, and the biggest issue is self-confidence um, and letting go of the stereotypes that we've been taught to believe about ourselves and to let go of thinking that we're only worth a minimum wage. So, like, learning Shopify is easy, tech is easy, uh, the biggest hurdle is getting over the beliefs that we have been, that have been ingrained to us by society and a lot of the beliefs that most of Canadian society still believes and that's, you know, our skill level um, and what our time is worth. And so learning how to reframe that, um, paying yourself, you know, actually being your own boss and determining your own future and what a good life means, that's the power you have with entrepreneurship. You get to choose that. You get to decide how much money you can make and how much money you want to make and how much money you need to make. So those are, those are some of the big common themes that I see. And it's really hard um, to do that in a, in a Western capitalistic society because you're really standing up by yourself as an individual where everybody around you looks at you as like a Western business, like you're just trying to be the best to make the most amount of money. And sometimes that practice can be recolonizing in a way. So it's really important, and I, I borrow this line from, uh, from Lynn all the time, it's find your community. You wanna be an entrepreneur? Find your community so you can stand up together. You can rise together, you can fail together, and you'll thrive together. Yeah. Powerful. <laughs> Powerful. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is about funding and where you can start with funding as like a small, do you start from scratch? Where can you go for funding? And where would you have liked uh, to start out or known what to start out with? <laughs> That's hard. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard. There's, there's a lot of avenues, but this goes back to, again, what I was talking about, access to capital, right? And as Indigenous people and as Indigenous women, we often don't have access to capital um, because that often stems from borrowing money from friends and family members or just having intergenerational wealth that we typically don't have, right? So that's why Sister Sage, um, we grew our business as the bootstrap business and we just kept, I worked full time and I, uh, I did Sister Sage on the, t on the side until it made enough sense to s switch that and just, I stopped working and started Sister Sage full time. Um, and that's the main way I grew my business. Um, but there are other avenues to, you know, get like grants or uh, loans, all of these different things, but also at that, to do that you need uh, credit, you need, um, uh, what do you call the signership, you need all of these different things that again, a lot of us don't have. I opened Broadway on credit cards. I did everything wrong uh, when I started. 
and uh, I learned the hard way. Um, with YVR, I've got some funding from TAC, um, but I had to put my condo on the line for my funding. And like I said, the price has gone up over 100% now from what I originally anticipated. So I'm, um, and I've already signed all the papers. So now I'm in the process of trying to raise more money as well. It's challenging. <laughs> That's my big thing now. I'm tired of reconciliation. I want reconciliation. Yeah. I feel like I was kind of lucky because um, before I took the BC3C program, I didn't know I wanted to be an entrepreneur at all. I, um, I ran someone else's business in my early 20s where he was just kind of like, this is your business. I'm off in Courtney doing my own thing. You just run this whole thing. And my experience from that was like, oh my, I hate business. I'm never going to be a business owner. This is the worst. I will not. Given it was a pawn shop, I was managing a pawn shop. So I mean, like, <laughs> it's a little different. But um, yeah, I came out of that being like, nah, never. And, and the only reason I took the BC3C course in the first place is because one of my younger sisters got to take it. It was a youth program. I had just turned 30 and I was no longer youth. So I was really offended. So when they opened it up to be up to 35, I was like, I'm getting in there. Not because I want to be a business owner or anything, but just because like now I have the opportunity, I'm going to do it. Um, and it turned, it, I mean, like it was very foundational, uh, that program, but it turned out to be awesome because they do give you that $1,000 microloan um, and a 45 day period to pay it back interest free. Um, so, I mean, like a thousand bucks isn't very much to start something on, but when, when you're pairing up with like Shopify, who gives you your first 30 days free, then when you start um, generating money, then you can pay for your next month with that. So, I, I'm, that $30 really, did, or $30, <laughs> that 30 bucks, <laughs> that $1,000 that we paid back was quite helpful for that 45 days and did get the ball, ball rolling. Um, we have had to put all of our own money in after that essentially, other than the money that's come back from that original, yeah, it's all, all bootstrapping. But that, that original $1,000 really did um, get the ball rolling, which I think is partially why we want to do the same thing, offer a $1,000 micro grant to um, new entrepreneurs that are starting up businesses because, you know, any little bit amount of money saves it from going on your credit card. <laughs> and <laughs> it sucks. It really sucks. Like, it is hard to find funding. If you do lots of research, you can find different avenues on the internet. There's TAC, like Inez mentioned, is pretty wonderful. They've got tons of funding as long as you have a uh, good idea of what you want to do with it. You know, you can't really go in there and be like, hey, so I heard you got some money. It doesn't, like, you kind of have to have a little bit of a plan. Um, there's, like, what, a future new future futurepreneur, futurepreneur, futurepreneur? Yeah, it's actually, like, really hard, though, to find some startup business mm -hmm. money is the complication. I would definitely check out Powwow Pitch because they're kind of oh, like yeah. the Dragon Den, but they're indigenous style. And you don't even have to have a business. You can just have a good, solid idea and just really pitch it to the, the judges. And there's a lot of prizes, but more importantly, there's a community. Huge you get exposure, community. you get connected to so many powerful Indigenous entrepreneurs, and it's just, it's just an amazing experience. And you can do it virtually. You just do a one-minute video to, to Pow Wow Pitch. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and just like, yeah, we're going to do a startup grant soon so you guys can follow us keep an eye out for that that should be coming pretty soon and we're going to continuously i think do our grants because we, we we see there's so much people who want to start but they they don't know where to start and that's that was like us like if we didn't have that program like how would we have started so that's kind of where we want to come in with our grant um and we do you want to add mentorship? So we will be that community for you if you're trying to start up. We will guide you as much as we can. We are we specialize in food, but we have other knowledge too. And yeah, just connect. If you if you're looking to start a business, just reach out and 
Uh, we yeah, can hop on a always, Zoom. People always have little little links to send along once you find the community. Yeah. They're like, oh, well, I got 50 bucks from these guys. So. <laughs> <laughs> have you tried emailing them? <laughs> or we can send you, like, just whatever information we have. We're, we're all about community and helping um, other people that are on this journey, too. We want to, we wanna, just like Lynn Marie, she was... She was there for us in the very beginning, and that inspired us. And we kind of we want to carry that on. And it sounds like Inez was that was that for um, Lynn Marie. So it's all about that community. Yeah. I build native with Shopify is a Powwow pitch partner, and right now they're running micro grants. So you can do a one minute pitch to Sunshine. I think you go to powwowpitch.org. Uh, you can submit your video there. So even beyond like the bigger pitch competition. We also partnered with the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business in the CDAP program, the Canadian Digital Adoption Program. So for the next three years, we're going to pick 500 Indigenous businesses to get $2,500 in grant money from the Canadian government. Um, that application process is going to be out soon, but you can see it on the CCAB website right now. Um, I don't know if somebody can get it and share it on Zoom, but that would be great. And then there's also uh, a program uh, with the federal government called the... Uh, Oh, it's like they use Aboriginal. So it's the Aboriginal Entrepreneur Program. Um, I think those are for a little bit bigger ventures, but you can get up to $250,000 in funding. And my best piece of advice would be not to get too caught up in that old school business model, thinking that you need a lot of overhead. Um, COVID really drove home the need to nail your online presence. Um, I think we were going to get there eventually, but that really accelerated, you know, what's possible online. And, you know, I've seen Indigenous businesses grow to six figures within a month. So it's, you know, don't worry about, don't worry about overhead. If you got 29 bucks, I can get you an online store. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's CDAP. Yeah, it's the Canadian Digital Adoption Program. It's going to be run through the CCAB. I don't know if it's a question, but um, I commend you ladies for what you're doing there and the hurdles that you're going through. And uh, wow, um, I'm in business too, and I can concur with some of the stuff that you guys go through. Um, as far as the uh, uh, First Nation languages, I think it's our right as First Nation in the very beginning to use our languages. It's common law. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got to practice that, um, whether the government says we have to use certain languages, but um, I see um, in the last probably 15 or 20 years, uh, the languages, there's so many other different languages that are in the bank systems and other systems. Even if you go to the internet, there's five different languages except for our own language and First Nation. I'm going like, what the heck's going on? So um, in terms of that part of it, I think we should uh, come together as First Nations across the country because it's in practice common law and go forward with that. So whatever business that we're doing and we want to market, sales, whatever, use our language. Yes. And if, like you said, yes. if the government wants to challenge us, we'll get, yeah. to get, get together and head down to Ottawa. <laughs> Come on down. <laughs> ready. The lawyers are here. <laughs> A lot of aunties and uncles that are going to come with us. Yeah, I love that. And that's that. These are the conversations. And this is the like, we want to inspire like start these conversations, start people thinking of that kind of stuff is it, it needs to change. It needs to change. And some of our languages are dying out. And this is a way to revitalize it is start throwing these projects at them. Right. And it just a lot of people haven't even do seen it before it's too late. And yeah. Like, and I we just want to spark this change. So. I, I love that. Um, I love what you have to say, and I love I mean, the support. And let's do it together. Let's come together. Yes, I mean uh, the changes have to come from us as First Nation people. We don't rely on somebody else to make changes for us when it comes to our language and our nations. We have the power to do that, and we got to practice that. Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't be waiting for anybody to say, "Hey, you know, we're going to make the, uh, we're going to use our languages." Hell no, we just use them and go forward. Yeah, yeah. Do it. <laughs> that's what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. So important. I got two more questions. Sorry, I'm trying to multitask here. Um, first off, I just wanted to give a shout out to Nancy from New As Acres, who's in the back as well. Also, um, a strong in entrepreneur, indigenous. Um, so uh, the question that I have online from Celeste is, 
Will either Salmon and Bannock or Bannon, Bang and Bannock uh, have a cookbook available anytime soon? Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Collab. <laughs> I'll Bannock, buy it. 100 different ways. <laughs> Page one. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Uh, it's not on. It's not on our um, our sites anytime soon. But we do share lots of recipes on our Instagram and on our website. We don't. Oh. <laughs> 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 yeah. And I wouldn't expect that either. We don't sell the the secret formula. You know, <laughs> we <laughs> other recipes. We we like to to play around in the kitchen with bannock because it is so versatile. So. If you want a, a recipe for Bannock cinnamon buns, that's on our website. You want a recipe for uh, Bannock <laughs> Benedict, it's on our website. Like just, just all kinds of um, inspirational ways that either us or other people have tried this versatile bread. So people get the idea that you know it's not just um, eaten with soup <laughs> or, or yeah, we, with your Boy Scouts. Yeah, we actually expect other people to buy the bag and send us their recipes. <laughs> That's kind of what we expect. <laughs> Send us your cool creations. <laughs> but maybe we can make a cookbook out of that. That's a cute idea. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Well, I'm Stacy Cootley. I'm from Merritt. I'm on Chief and Counsel for Upper Nicklebant. And I just wanted, there were some questions related to funding for what these um, ladies went through in their own business. And um, I just kind of wanted to do a plug right now for National Aboriginal Capital Corporations of Canada. They just rolled out an Indigenous Women's Entrepreneur Program. So you can have a loan up to 45% non-repayable and you repay the 55%. So for any indi Indigenous women entrepreneur that want to get into business, um, you can come and see me. I'll give you the name that you, or the website that you go to, but um, it'll kind of help you wanted to get into business. Um, these, these fine ladies up here have set a great example. They've um, actually moved mountains and hills and jumped a lot of hurdles to get to where they are today. But NACA has seen the need to help Indigenous women get into business for the same reasons that these, this um, panel has disclosed here. Limp, limp. Thank you. I'm now I'm going to be checking that out and sending off all of the. I heard these people give you 50 bucks. <laughs> I wonder is that startup money or is that yeah startup? Okay, that's exciting. Yeah, that's good. Good yeah. resources. There's another program that's run through NACA as well. It's called the IACE program. So for the University of Victoria, uh, it's a 12-week entrepreneurship program. Um, set up the same way through the AFIs. I think they forgive 75% though. Um, so depending on your local AFI, that's how you apply. Thanks for having us. <laughs> this is amazing. Yeah, I don't know. I, was, I, I wasn't expecting this. It was such a good conversation. I'm glad Tracy came up. Like, you're, you, you deserve to be up here with us. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, everybody. This has been great. Thanks, everyone. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, ladies. Thank you so much for all that you do for our communities and for continuing to to lift all of us up and lead the way and show that economic development can be done differently and that um, all of us can benefit, not just one. So thank you so much. We're now going to break till 3.15 um, and we'll have uh, two speakers after 3.15 and we'll wrap up the day. So refreshments out back where they've been all day. For those of you on Zoom, have a stretch and uh, some refreshments and we'll gather back here at 3.15. You can go buy your sister's sage and your bang and bannock on the break as well. So we'll see you in 15 because we have two wonderful speakers left to wrap us up. So I have um, the, in the incredible pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Brad Mercer from the Nishka Nation. And 
when I was sent the agenda, I was like, is it, did they mean to put Bert Mercer <laughs> or Art Mercer? <laughs> who I've also met uh, on my travels when I was working in the Nishka Nation a number of years ago. So it's wonderful to meet you, Brad. Um, I'm guessing that you're related to both of those gentlemen. Uh, and Brad Mercer is from the Nishka Nation. He works for the Nishka Development Corporation and the Economic Development of Nishka Gassamics Vancouver Society. Um, the Nishka Gassamics Vancouver Society is a Nishka in Gitsan um, First Nations. Sorry, my apologies. Brad is Nishka in Gitsan First Nations from Northern BC. And he is also from the Nishka community of New Ayange, also known as Gitmadik. He is from the Frog and Raven clan house called Sim Sian. And he is here to talk to us today about the Gassamics Development Corporation, which is the Nishka Urban Corporation. So please help me in welcoming Brad Mercer to the stage. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I want to start by um, thanking the organizers of this uh, economic development event for First Nations throughout the province. And just before I start, I just wanted a quick question from you. Uh, how many of you are economic development officers? Uh, how many of you are community development people? What about village government, band council? Okay, that's, that's what I'm looking for, that type of audience to, to speak the same lingo with and share my story about uh, what we do for economic development as an indigenous community. So basically, we are uh, a Nishka organization, and I wanted to start by doing what is important. Where? There? Oh, okay. So that's what we're about. Um, we want to share our story with you today, and I'll try be crystal clear to give you the same vision that we have for economic development, what it means to us. So to start, I just wanted to uh, thank our brothers and sisters where we sit today, where we play, where we work, uh, the Squamish, and Muscat. You notice on there we have other indigenous names as well. And that's because with our Nishkatamics Vancouver Society, we look after 1,800 Nishka members in the lower mainland area from Vancouver Island all the way to Kelowna. So we have a vast area to, to take care of our citizens in the southern part of BC. This is uh, going to be a couple of quick videos just to give you a snapshot about who we are and I just want to thank our Lissom's Government Economic Development Department Bert Mercer for sharing these uh, economic uh, videos for us to share with you. In order to look toward the future you must be grounded in your past. As such one of the first things we did as a group during the economic strategic planning session was look at the history of the Nisqa economy. While our timeline began tens of thousands of years ago, we chose to look at some of the significant events that have taken place since the 1600s, when the Hudson's Bay Company noted 400 canoes headed for Fishery Bay. 
We discussed the milestones that have been important to the Niska economy, such as the rise in forestry and silviculture in the 1980s, including the launch of Twin River Timber in 1984. The 1990s saw the rise of many industries, including a pine mushroom boom, small logging companies, and Niska fisheries. One of the biggest events in the history of the Niska Nation was the Niska Final Agreement, which came into effect on May the 11th, 2000. This is followed by the creation of the commercial Niska Fisheries a few months later. Many other significant events have occurred since then. The road to Gilvold was completed in 2002, providing road access between all four Niska villages. The Niskat Commercial Group and Niskat Pacific Ventures were formed. One of the significant insights we had while discussing the history of Niskat economic development was the presence of a number of very distinctive phases of economic development since 1980. The first phase, beginning in the early 1970s to 1990, was defined by massive deforestation and resource depletion. This was a phase of learning and growth. The second phase, roughly spanning 1990 to 2000, was marked by excitement for a hard-won fight for the Niskat Final Agreement, and the development of legal structures required to transition from the Indian Act to self-governance. With the Final Agreement in place post-2000, Economic development has been defined by a lack of communication, the purchase of infrastructure, the growth of tourism, and an optimistic recession. The final agreement provides many opportunities, and it is up to us to implement them using Niska values as the foundation. This is really the essence of the work that needs to be done under Niska Economic Prosperity Strategic Plan. A key insight was developed throughout our discussion. We cannot accomplish very much without building our human capacity to fully realize the opportunities and certainty our treaty holds. The visual of the timeline along the Nass River really captures the essence of where we've been and where we're going. We have been leaders in modern nation building and are examples of treaty negotiations that other nations strive to learn from. We have a long, full history of managing our lands, and the visual in this section captures the richness of this history, while also suggesting the direction we need to take in the future. In order to look toward the future, you must be grounded in your past. As such, one of the first things we did as a group during the economic strategic planning session was look at the history of the Niska economy. While our timeline began tens of thousands of years ago, we chose to look at some of the significant events that have taken place since the 1600s, when the Hudson's Bay Company noted 400 canoes headed for Fishery Bay. We discussed the milestones that have been important to the Niska economy such as the rise in forestry and silviculture in the 1980s, including the launch of Twin River Timber in 1984. The 1990s saw the rise of many industries, including a pine mushroom boom, small logging companies, and Niska fisheries. One of the biggest events in the history of the Niska Nation was the Niska Final Agreement, which came into effect on May the 11th, 2000. This is followed by the creation of the commercial Niska fisheries a few months later. Is this the same one? I thought it changed, sorry. <laughs> Can you put the next one on? I'm not a techie.
Okay. Okay, so that's the first one and they said they'll play the, the second one at the end. So with that being said by our government, uh, the door is open for us to look at different ways to establish economic development for our people. Us being in an urban environment, working and playing in the Vancouver area, it's a different, uh, different concept compared to something back home on treaty land or village government or band office, whatever word you want to use. So us, the scenario is how do we make that change to make it work for our citizens in the lower mainland area. So we started by, um, and, and this is fairly new for us, like uh, our, our Zamek Society just launched the ECDEV department last August and I took on that role, moving into that from uh, running it back up in Nishka territory. So community economic development, urban innovations is uh, kind of the things we want to talk about today to share our story and give you some insight as to how it's working for us in such a short period of time. Um, we, we consider our Nishka people in the Vancouver area, they're the innovators. Just like today you saw these uh, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, the women in business, uh, same story. We, when we started in November, to identify who our people are in the Lower Mainland that are interested in small business. Small business is a big part of economic development. You're supporting, you're creating your own economy. That's how you got to think about it. So the innovators to us is our people that are interested. So last November, we had a two day business forum. We invited our partners. Partners is a huge word for economic development very huge and you could think of it many many ways it's always going to be partners you can't do anything without a partner you can't do anything by yourself so the benefits for us by doing that uh, business forum we started with three small businesses at the end of that event we got 33 now with our partners just an example we reached out to the Lower Mainland uh, organizations that are already doing the work. We didn't have to pretend that we knew what we were doing or reinvent the wheel. We partnered with professionals that could help our small business entrepreneurship people. Not just regular small businesses, we also had the women's program and uh, Futurepreneur so now everybody is uh, going through the baby steps. These organizations are working one-on-one -on -one with them right now as we speak to get them ready. And at the same time, we're, we're still reaching out for more partners because uh, community economic development, your backbone is innovators. You know, all of you are innovators. You have good visions, good ideas, good concepts. But, you know, we can't, if we don't help support our, our own people, then what's the use of trying to do business? Do we really want to just sign a joint venture and get screwed, blued, and tattooed on it? Or do we want to start supporting our own people to create our own economy? Because in reality, 99% of BC is covered on indigenous lands nobody else's land but and the other thing about this is uh, using the word major projects there's no such thing as a major project there's things about creating economy but we can't use the word major because it scares our people away especially on cultural values and if you work with community 
you'll always have that big discussion about cultural values protecting your land. And it goes the same way in an urban environment. We have those discussions. So this is our community, basically, where, where we have our people located in the lower mainland. And it deals with uh, different ideas, different solutions. And we work closely with our, our membership with this. Uh, this is who we support. Like, these are our people here. Like I said, I was kind of jumping the gun, uh, cultural values. Uh, that's a big thing for us. And it's a part of community development, which is a part of economic development. Community development for us is our cultural value, our product, which we have had in Vancouver for a long time. And that's Hobie. That's our Nishkan year where we open our door to celebrate our cultures, our values, our respect, our love, through opening that window to celebrate the Nishkan year every February here in Vancouver. So we're very uh, proud of that. It's a community event, community development. And at the same time, with this uh, actual tourism, cultural tourism product, it's going to expand a bit starting next year with the same partners that we're creating right now. It's, uh, it's going to be bigger, better, all under one roof, the biggest cultural festival in the Lower Mainland. So that's uh, something that we're quite proud of. Okay, the growth plan. Why do we want to focus our econom economic development uh, opportunities this way. So basically what we've done is we've identified the needs of our people that are residing here. As an example, every day or every week we have Anishka leaving the Lower Mainland or Anishka coming into the Lower Mainland. So our numbers are up and down, 1,800 right now. But what we've started on our growth plan through economic development is we've started identifying how should we get into the housing in the Lower Mainland? It's not our backyard, but how do we do it? You know, there's a lot of focus on housing back home for people to move home to, to go to work in the new economy plan. But a lot of people choose to live here, whether it's for post-secondary, maybe medical, uh, you know, it goes on and on the list. So the economic plan for, for us is to, to start developing our own housing, which we've done. We've found the right partners. We're moving forward. Uh, a foundation platform, that's again, that's creating good partnerships to support our, our society. Because within our society, we have programs and services, outreach. Uh, we support our uh, seniors. And now we're getting into housing and for sure culture our cultural values, we want to retain our identity in an urban environment and make sure that our language is taught to all Nishkas that want to learn it. And that was talked about last week at our Nishkalism's government assembly. Like, our identity is going to be, it's not going to disappear. And so that's going to be big for us in an urban environment to have that service offered to us. So that part, we, we will be searching for all kinds of uh, funding sources to make sure that that happens for, for those who want to pursue that. So, again, the key word is partnerships. Uh, this goes many ways, many opportunities. We've got uh, the foundation group, the housing, our economic arm, that's a part of community development where we created the economic arm. It's Amex Development Corp. And so those are all key to us to succeed. I'm not really going to read these. I kind of said it already. So community development. Same with this one. It'll be on the online, right? OK. Uh, this is my baby uh, when I started here to support the small businesses. And again, it's all about engagement, uh, 
making the right assessment, finding the right partners to help us develop our own Nishka Small Business uh, support group. So these are all basically uh, different partners that are in agreement to work with us to, to start moving forward when our small businesses are ready to, to kind of rock and roll. There's still a little bit more baby steps to take, um, like for looking at one-year training platforms for them to, to make sure they're ready. Um, everybody fails in life, and especially business people, because you know, if you want to be a good entrepreneur, you got to get beat up once in a while. You know, you can't <laughs> you can't walk around with your head high and expecting you're the best. Nobody does that. <laughs> so, part of the training, baby steps. That's it. Like we're we're creating some customized curriculum to to support our people, because a lot of our people are shy people, especially our women. I'm not saying that in a bad way, but it's just the way it is. Like, but what they do in life. It's all up here, it's not in a textbook, especially with arts and crafts and cooking and, you know, making stuff. They're good at it, but at some point we have to help them to, to get them uh, stronger. So that's what I'm getting at. I'm not saying anything negative about our people. And we do have a laddering system on, on Nishka Small Business Support. To me right now it's chunk chains and I'm hoping that that changes. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big job to, to support small businesses and that's key to any economic development department is to find solutions, how to keep them motivated and not lose their interest. It's just like an employment center where there's oodles of money out there for trying to pretend to put people to work, but they don't go to work, they just get binders of tickets and they don't, I know that because I used to assess some of these people and Johnny, why are you still here? You got 20 binders of tickets, go to work, go to camp. You know, so it's a different story for, for small businesses. So we need to uh, work together to, to find more funding for our First Nations people in small business. I have a solution I'll, I'll get to in a bit, I'm just saying that there's there's not enough uh, funding for to support small business, and this is basically what I was getting at is is, uh, and this is an, on a on a partnership plan to, you know what we're developing here for our our people is a Nishka Business Accelerator Incubator Program, that's developed by our Nishka Lissom's government. We're hoping they launch that soon so we could start that online approach with our people and uh, looking at ad advisory services again that's through big partnerships for people that are based in the lower mainland that have that professional background that can offer services for our, our entrepreneurs um, the other big thing is the internship program where we can definitely branch out and partner in any industry to support people with that experience that wants to come in and work with our people. That's, that's key and there's a lack of it and there should be more of it. So far with community economic development in Zamex in the Vancouver area We've moved a lot. We moved a lot of ground in a short period of time. The first goal was to engage and partner. If you can do that, you can win. And there's so much associations and societies out there that are turnkey, meaning they're ready to rock and roll if you are, but you gotta come up with the right solution and be brave don't just sit and listen. You know, if you don't want to do it, then the people are going to lose and your economic development department isn't going to win. That's what I see. That's what I saw. <clears throat> it's different in every community. It's different for every tribe, you know, especially in an urban environment 
you know, we're, we're playing with literally nothing. Like we don't, <laughs> we're visiting here. We're not, uh, we're not shareholders on the land here. So we have to be friends and partners with our people. And that's what we do. Like uh, we have a lot of good friends with First Nations in the Lower Mainland. And that's important for us. So this leader here was our, our past president, Dr. Joe Gosnell. He supported economic development right from the get-go. You know, he was uh, an ambassador to our nation. Uh, he was a part of the treaty. And this is the reason why we want to move forward in developing positive attitudes to all of our partners, our brothers and sisters throughout the province, that economic development is a serious word you got to know all of the words that are a part of it to understand why is it so important to us as a First Nations. It's not just about business, it's about community. You know, it's, it's a huge, huge word. So I just wanted to share that with you uh, because uh, this chief was, you know, he was uh, per pretty powerful to us and did a lot of work, good things for us. So now I want to switch to economic development. Sure, we have community development, small business, all that stuff. It's all good. But then again, what about the economic arm? Do you have an economic arm? What is it to you? For us, as an urban environment, that's key. Because we're running as a society, a society <laughs> doesn't come cheap when we have 1,800 members living in our area in the Lower Mainland. So that's the reason why we formed Zamex Development Corporation, the economic arm for our Nishka Vancouver Zamex Society. So the reason for forming this for-profit company was to to look at solutions to support our society such as seniors investing in housing supporting our cultural values our events for cultural tourism those are just some examples there's a huge list outreach and homelessness so the whole intention of the business is to to support our society we're not like another competitor company from back home where it's just Johnny and Eric that are started a company and they're bidding against us. We have a reason. That's our reason. That's how we win bids right now. You know, we, we have a purpose with our corporation. We're not doing it just to make a quick buck. We're doing it to invest in our community here. So Again, these are on, will be available online. Uh, I'm not going to get into it too much. But what this means to us with a for-profit corporation is we still got to do the same business as economic development has to do. Create partnerships. Okay. <laughs> so basically, partnerships is key if you want to invest and you got to find the right partners, especially for business, because the wording you use for your business is key again, just like regular ECTEV. If you want to get screwed blue tattooed, go for it. But you got to be serious about your wording when you, when you talk business. So I'm quickly going to run it there. So uh, these are just examples of the things we are working on or we are doing. Uh, I want get into what we're doing right now but you know we are expanding and just to be clear what we're doing we're ready to share with everybody meaning a lot of these businesses we're creating are going to be franchises 
where we train, educate your community, and you have a revenue stream. Just the same what we want to do back home on our treaty lands. Sure, why compete? But if it's a win-win, everybody's going to win, right? The good thing about us is the profit sharing agreements is we look after our people first and foremost. And at the end of the day, how are we winning right now? We created the right partners with investment groups, meaning we don't have to fill out 50 binders of paperwork that <clears throat> it's all pre-set up through the Indian Act and Canada, BC. We're not interested in that. We found a better way, and we're willing to share that with other First Nations that want to work with us. So if you're interested, you can email me. Uh, it'll be online, and I got cards here as well. Uh, I'm running out of time. So again, this is partnerships who we deal with. This will be online. So I was hoping to show that last video, but can you show that last video? In this video, we explore Nisqa economic branding. Branding isn't just a logo, name, or tagline. Corporations are not the only ones who benefit from branding. Nations do as well. It's about discovering what truly makes the Nisqa nation unique. As an aspirational message that captures the Nisqa potential. And then building a platform and strategy around it that nurtures that brand and attracts others who share the value and vision. An economic branding statement must capture who the Niska are and why external partners such as industry and customers such as tourists would want to do business. To develop a draft economic branding statement, we looked at two different perspectives. How do others view us? shown above the water, and how do we view ourselves, shown below the water, while recognizing those perspectives may overlap at times or be very different. This process proved that we very much know who we are as an Iskat people. We are powerful and proud, generous and sharing, honest and professional, friendly and inclusive, we have 113 years of patience, and we view ourselves as the seafood capital of British Columbia and Canada. We are grounded in our culture and our ayuk. We are compassionate to others and ourselves. We own our land outright and are proud and strong in this knowledge. We are Dachget. We are the land of the sleeping giant now awake. Others see us in similar ways to the way we see ourselves, with steadfast and strong leaders, with a capacity to be humorous. To others we say, Am we welcome you. We are seen as united as a nation. We are known as the Lava people. We may be occasionally seen as arrogant, controversial and silent to those that do not know us well, though others see us as direct. We, also, we are also known as innovative trailblazers and protectors of our water with endless opportunity. Working together, we drafted an economic branding statement to share our Niska economic brand with the world. Certainty in your experience, in your access, in your investment, in all things the Nisqa guarantee, authentically Nisqa. It is this brand that we will continue to build strong and communicate widely to the world. Thank you for your patience, and if you want a card, I'll be sitting in the back. It'll be nice to chat to all of you, especially tomorrow, do some networking. So thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Brad, for sharing all the wonderful stuff that you're leading and the Gasamix Development Corporation is leading as well and for your generosity in wanting to share all of the successes with the rest of us and our communities and our people. So um, Brad will be here tomorrow as well if you wanna reach out to him. And uh, he, the, his presentation and his contact information will be posted online for those of you who are on Zoom. So we have a really special guest here to wrap us up this afternoon. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from her. Um, we have a professional storyteller, educator, and published author that will be um, sharing her gifts uh, with us this afternoon. And I think it's quite fitting to um, end our day with um, the gifts from this beautiful woman. So it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Kun Jade, who is, like I said, a professional storyteller, educator, and published author belonging to the Haida, Musqueam, and Squamish First Nations. Her Haida name, Kun Jade, means moon woman and was presented to her at her great uncle's memorial feast by her cousin, Crystal Robinson. Over the past 28 years, Kun Jade has performed traditional Haida legends while also sharing vivid personal stories about her clan's survival of the smallpox epidemic and the history and culture of her people. She has performed at hundreds, likely thousands of festivals, schools, and Indigenous celebrations across Canada. So please join me in welcoming Kun Jade to the stage. Santaja Salitla, good afternoon. The Lankenge Ash Ande Hangelga, it's good to see you all. The Lankhatskit La Uslang, I think maybe I should put it over here, right? So you can actually see it. I have some, I have my books here. I have my Gujao, my drum. And I'm going to remove my mask now so you can actually hear me. This is my territory, so I'm so glad to be able to um, welcome you all. Dalang Usia Chuga, you are all welcome here. Dalang Wadlawan Ashkit Lagang, I thank each and every one of you for being here. And as I said when my mask was on, Dalang Katsket La Uslang, you all look really good. Gyalthang it's a true story. I don't tell any lies. I do belong to the Raven Clan, but I do tell the truth. So I am uh, speaking in Hadkil. This is Haida language. Um, I am wearing my Haida regalia. I am also Squamish. I was born a baker. I, um, I'm thinking of returning to that name. Be uh, last year I was apprenticing with my, um, my uncle Sapalak or Bob Baker. He was teaching me the stories. I won't be t telling you any of the Squamish stories today. What I want to do is I want to tell you one of my stories um, that I w it was my first book that was published. It's uh, Raven's Feast. So uh, my language is a linguistic isolate. Uh, my parents don't speak my language. In fact, I'm the only one in my family who speaks the language. I, I am mentoring my youngest child. After just four sessions, we were speaking fluently. I am not fluent. There are 20 fluent speakers left in our world, 4,000 Haidas, and only 20 fluent speakers. I wish I were fluent, but we're getting there. So um, I also have taught my language in the past to students from uh, preschool, uh, from the Language Nest program, all the way up to uh, grade five, and actually older students as well. And uh, if you want tips, on acquiring your languages, I know what to do.
so kung ja de hinu had kishka di kyang, my hara name is Moon Woman. Yala gustu di kualagang, I'm from the raven side. There are two main clans with the Haida, we are ravens or eagles. My mother is raven and my father is eagle. This is an ideal Haida marriage. Just don't tell my mom and dad I said that. <laughs> Sorry, mom and dad, if you're listening, but uh, 55 years of marriage going on 56, I might be saying the same thing about me and my katai. No, don't tell him I said that either. I might get in trouble over here because my katai, my sweetheart, is also eagle, he, and uh, he's such a, a good man. I am so grateful for him. So, Yakulana Studius Gagang, I'm from the Yakulanas Raven Clan. Kadsne Studius Gagang, I'm from the Shark House wearing my regalia and introducing myself like this if I were in my village of Elklage of Old Masset, uh, introducing myself like this, everyone would know automatically if we're related or not. So I am going to tell you uh, a traditional legend. The first legend, I'm stretching out the phrase for a very long time because this story started so very long ago. A wash. A A ago before our world and universe when there was nothing when there was no one except for darkness there was one supernatural being flying in this darkness forever and ever and ever sometimes he is called Yash sometimes he's called Hoya sometimes he's called Nenkislas he whose voice must be obeyed Raven our trickster our creator separate from the clan that I belong to this is the trickster, the creator of all. And Yash flew in every direction for eons and eons and eons of ages. He was looking for a place to land, but he never found any, no matter the direction he took. And that darkness was thick and heavy, eh, yes. But somehow it slipped under his feathers and skin. It surrounded his coke. It got into his mind and every part of his flu, his body. And at first it just moved him around this way and that, but then it started pulling him apart in every direction. It would destroy him, but he is the Yash, an Unsidangang. He knows who he is. So he flapped his wings hard and fast and harder and faster, and the darkness came out of him and around him until it made a great ball. Our world, so beautiful, it took his breath away as he went, Hani <gasps> that is so beautiful. I must change myself into a very handsome two-legged, into a human, into a man. In my new body, I'll go into this world, I'll fix it, I'll make it even better than it is. It's almost perfect, but it needs land. It needs fresh water. It needs the swimmers, the crawlers, the four-leggeds. It needs the flyers, and it needs other two-leggeds. Kange anga, dear people. That's what you are listening to my story. You are kange anga, you are dear people. I could stand here for the rest of the day and all night tonight, and every day and every night, until I grow to be 150 years old, that's a very long time from now in case you think I look really good for my age. What would I be doing in all this time? I'd be telling you raven story after raven story after raven story. I'll, even the youngest of you will grow old with me. Eh, yes you will. But I will not get to tell all the raven stories that exist. So I wanna show you my book. So in 2016, this man called me up and said, Kong Jade, I want to take one of your stories and I want to make it into a book. And I thought, I don't know who this bozo is. 
I'll just humor him for a few minutes and I'll hang up the phone because I'm sick and tired of scam calls. And he kept talking and I thought, oh, I think the bozo's telling the truth. And he actually knows I thought he was a bozo. <laughs> He's like, you thought I was a bozo? <laughs> uh, he said, Kongja Day, could you please send me some of your stories, me and the editor. And you know, this is way pre-pandemic. So I was able to like easily write like type up four stories and send them off to them. Uh, since the pandemic, one paragraph, then nothing. And then another par paragraph, nothing. There's nothing going on upstairs. But I'll just pretend. And so they chose Raven's Feast. And then a little while later, they asked me to write with the, uh, with the editor, the preschool version, so Gifts from Raven was created, and I love doing this one because it rhymes. I like to drive my Katai crazy by rhyming all his words. <laughs> so after Raven created our world, and he put the land where it needed to be, and then he put fresh water where it needed to be, and then he took everything that swims and he put them into the waters, and they swam and swam. And then he took all of the things that crawl, all of the bugs, and put them on the earth and watched as some crawled up and some crawled down. And then he took all of the four-leggeds and put them on the earth and he stood far, far back and watched as they moved around the entire world to where they wanted to be. And then he made all of the winged ones all of the flyers and put them into the air and they flew around him and it made him so happy. And then he made all of the nations of two-leggeds in all the colors that we're now living in today and put everyone on the earth in one place because he wanted everyone to live together. But those humans, they, they thought they knew better and they divided themselves into the four main nations and they moved to the four directions on their own. Yash said, Hu Laga, it's all right. He went into the world, to their villages, their settlements, and taught them how to be Kangai Anga, how to be dear people, how to gather their food and prepare it, how to build their shelters, how to sing, how to dance, how to tell their stories, how to look after the very old and the very young. And when he was done in the rest of the world, he flew to Haida Gwaii the land of the people, where there were more than 30,000 Haida ancestors living there. And he taught them all the same things. And when he was done, he said, Ah, Kliyanu, finally, Hudi Echgegang, I'm finished. And he went over and he built his own Na'i ones, his own big house made of cedar. He gathered some chin, some fish, and he prepared it. He found fresh anch water and he drank it. He thought he'd rest for a very long time, but Ganu, no. The next day he got up and he built another Na'i ones beside his house. And then he built another, and then he built another, and then another. And then he said, I wonder why I'm building so many houses. Oh, yeah. I don't know. So he built and built and built for 50 years. When he said, I had deal akala uslang, I'm really exhausted today. But he walked all the way back to his house. He ate that chin. He drank the anch. And then he asked himself a question. What am I feeling inside? I'm lonely. I'm lonely for the company of other humans. I don't know what to do about it. Oh, I know. I'll have a laganat. I'll have a feast. I'll invite everyone to my feast. So he stood to invite his guests when he said, Ah, yeah, what am I doing? I only have enough food for myself. So he set his fishing nets. He got out his clam baskets and his seaweed baskets. And he got out his berry baskets and his hunting spear. And he hunted and he fished and he gathered food as days and weeks and months and years passed. But each day that he gathered food, he would clean it and prepare it. And some of it, he would lay in the sun or hang in the wind to dry, and then he carefully put it away. And for other food, he cleaned it, he prepared it, and he hung it and lit a fire underneath it, and then he carefully put it away. And he said, Laganat, ah, yeah. 
what am I doing? I don't have any gifts for my guests. So this time he took his tools and he went into the world and he gathered cedar bark and made dajungay hats and kigwe baskets. He made capes, skirts, sleeping mats. He made drums and drumsticks. He made paddles, canoes. He carved totem poles. He made jewelry. And it took days, it took weeks, it took months, it took years upon years. But when he was making his final gift, he said, eh, laganat kasket we arawang. Yes, it's time for the feast. And he invited his guests in a very special way. He stood and he faced the east. Now, I'm an urban, so I don't know the directions. <laughs> but my uncle also taught me, my uncle, my gogi Huya, he told me this story that I'm telling you right now. He's passed on into the next world and has become my ancestor. He told me it's very rude to turn your back on your audience, so I will face you because I am so happy to be able to be performing this live instead of on a Zoom call and looking at my own face. I love my face, but that's besides the point. <laughs> he stood and he faced the East and he counted and stomped his foot four times. So I'm going to say, We are going to count to four in Haida language. And it's up to you if you want to stomp your foot too. Swanson, I hear some people, Stung, Shonish, Stanson, Angola Ayaga, good job. He looked to the eastern horizon and he saw coming from this direction all the red skinned peoples of our world, all the indigenous speaking peoples of our world speaking their languages, wearing their traditional clothing, traveling in their canoes, and he welcomed them to the territory. You are all welcome here. It's good to see you all. You all look really good. Y'all come over here and then sit down. And then he turned to the south. We are going to count to four and hide a language again. Swanson, Stung, Shlonish, Stanson, Angola Ayaga. He looked to the southern horizon and he saw coming from this direction all the yellow skinned peoples of our world, all the Asian speaking peoples of our world speaking their languages, traveling in their canoes, wearing their traditional clothing, and he welcomed them to the territory. And then he turned to the west. Did you notice I didn't translate for you? You know my language now, right? Swanson. Stung. Shonish. Stanson. Angola Ayaga, he looked to the western horizon and he saw coming from this direction all the black skinned peoples of our world, all the African speaking peoples of our world, speaking their languages, wearing their traditional clothing, traveling in their canoes, and he welcomed them to the territory. And he asked them a question, but he's raven, right? He's getting so excited, he didn't wait for their response. Instead, he answered as if they asked him. He said, Gusunu ayat dalang edang. How are you all today? Ayat diu gurang ayat lagang. I am happy today. Hashkwishis talu wagen kawang ushla. And then he turned to the north. Hausen stansentlu khadkil dalang kwaenda sang. Deed lasu, this is the last time we'll count. Swanson stung. He looked to the northern horizon and he saw coming from this direction all the white-skinned peoples of our world, all the European-speaking peoples of our world, traveling in their canoes, wearing their traditional clothing, speaking their languages, and he welcomed them to the territory. 
You are all welcome here. The Lankenge Ash Andi Hangelga, it's good to see you all. The Lankatsket La Ashlang, you all look really good. Gusinu Ayet, the Lang Edung, how are you all today? Ayet, do you good and eight Langang Ayet Dila Ashlang, I'm really good today. Of course, he didn't wait for them to answer. He said, Hashkwishestalu Wagen Kawangushla, how we do? Y'all hurry up. He introduced himself. And one by one, those groups of people introduced themselves. And they sang their songs, they danced their dances, they told their stories. And it truly was Laganat Kasketwe Arawang. It was time for the feast. And Yash brought out Tawe Kwan, a whole lot of food for that feast. And they feasted as days and nights and weeks and months upon months upon years passed around them. They continued to feast together. And when it was Istide Kasketwe Arawang, when it was time for them to leave, he gave each guest a gift or gifts and sent them back to the four directions from where they had come from. Kongai Anga, dear people, that's what you are, listening to my stories. You are Kongai Anga, you are dear people. We have all been invited to Raven's Feast. You were invited the day you were born. Dalang Wadluan, each and every one of you, you were born with a gift or gifts that you're meant to learn what those gifts are and practice them with your whole self so that you can be a shining light to those around you who don't yet know what their gifts are. There's one more part of my story. Dalang Wadluan, each and every one of you, you have tens of thousands of ancestors who love you no matter what, who will always love you, who have always loved you. I'm going to give you all homework because I'm a teacher and I won't get to check it and it's going to take your whole lives to do it. Yang or lang, it's easy. Well, that's also teats. It's, it's a little hard. I want you to remember that you have tens of thousands of ancestors who love you always and I want you to hug yourselves every day and tell yourselves, I love me for as long as you live. Because you deserve your own love. And our world needs more love every day and for as long as you live. And this is how we put more love into it. It takes a long time to love oneself and it's worth it. Because when you love yourself completely, because you're meant to love what you look like, you're meant to love the size that you are. I used to think I was statuesque and then my kids grew up. You're meant to love the age that you're at. These are things you cannot change. Your body is your real home. You're beautiful and perfect as you are. You always have been, you always will be. But once you love yourself completely, and there's some things you can change if you want. If you're unkind, be kind. If you're unhelpful, be helpful. All those different things, you know that. But when you love yourself completely, a miracle happens. It's a true story. I love each and every one of you. Do I know you? Ganu. Does it matter? Ganu. I don't always tell people that I love them, but I show them. So can you do your homework? <laughs> forever. I'm going to add to your homework. You thought you were going to get off easy. <laughs> Sorry, I laugh so hard at my own silly jokes. <laughs> so your addition, the additional homework is this. Once you love yourself, I want you to teach everyone around you about their tens of thousands of ancestors who love them no matter what. I want you to teach them to hug themselves every day for as long as they live. I love me. You know the world that we're in right now. It's so different. It's so very different and it's very hard in many ways. But I believe that this is how we can change the world. When you love yourself completely, you make the world a better place. 
Now, I'm telling you this message right now because I'm going to share something with you that's so important. I had to learn this the hard way. 16 years ago, I almost died. This is how I learned how to love myself. Actually, I've almost died three times. It's like no big deal now. <laughs> My humor is dark. I can't help it. But um, each time I learned something important. And 16 years ago, I felt the unconditional love from my chinny, from my grandpa, my dad's dad. I felt him come into my hospital room when I was very sick and leaving for the next world. There wasn't anything the doctors could do for me. They couldn't even address my pain because I'm allergic to absolutely everything. But my chinny came and I felt his love. And I took that love and I sent it into the world to everyone that I know. I didn't care if they remembered. I didn't care if they hated me. I sent love to absolutely everyone and made it around the entire world. And that's when I realized, because I was only about 100 pounds at the time, that I had enough love inside my broken body that it filled the whole universe. And that's when I started to cry, when I realized for the first time in my life, I loved me and I was going to get better because I deserved it. I'm so grateful to all of you for accepting your homework. <laughs> I want to sing you a song because my gujao is right here and I can feel that it needs to sing. And I won't be able to hold the microphone, but that's what, my voice is pretty loud when I sing. It's not as loud when I speak. I, uh, but that's okay. I'm going to hold my guja to find out which song wants to be sung because the stories have their own spirits and the songs do too. And when, uh, I, when I introduce something, if a different story comes out, if a different song comes out, then uh, somebody here had to hear it that way. So I tried to honor that, those spirits as much as possible. How ah. Uh, This is the peace song. Lugganut Alame. Thank you. 
Chen Kwan Man told me. Thank you. Haichka. Osiam. Thank you so much for listening to me telling you this story. I am so grateful for your ears. I, uh, and I really don't have that much else to share with you. I, I mean, I could talk about so much else, but I feel that it's the end of the day and you've been listening for a very long time and I know that I'm a raven that used to be very shy. I used to be ashamed of who I was. And that was because an armed forces base moved into my community of Klug Outlas of New Masset. And they created their own school and grocery store and recreation center, their own homes. And they were given misinformation about who we were as Haida, what they thought we were as indigenous people. And those children used to bully me in groups of two or 17 or 100. When I'd start to feel good about myself, they'd remind me before school, during school, at recess, after school, every day from kindergarten to grade seven, of what a horrible human being I was. And I believed them. I hated myself so much, I wished I'd never been born. I really contemplated my own suicide at age 16. And when my mother, I told my mother, my mother is only like five feet tall, but she's very fierce. <laughs> and she said, you will not do that because if you do, I'll come into the next world and I'll drag you back here. And I said, oh, I'm, yeah, do walking. Oh, I'm scared. Okay, mom, I'll stay in this world. I got married. I had three kids. And when my eldest son started kindergarten, I realized I no longer had permission to be ashamed. I no longer had permission to hate myself. Because if I had this self-hatred and this shame, I'd pass it on to my three children. So I took the button robe that I'm wearing, made by Dean Non Chaos, my great-grandmother, Beatrice Brown. She was 90, no, she was 86 years old when she made this ro robe for me. And she presented it to me at my high school graduation. She has over 100 descendants. I'm very fortunate to be her eldest great-grandchild because my little sister and little brother do not have a robe made by her hands. I brought this robe in and I told this story. This was my first story that I told in my son's kindergarten class. And the children in his class looked at him and said, you are so lucky. My little boy sat up so tall with a big smile on his face from ear to ear. And I thought to myself, that's why I have to do this. I have to do this for him. But I'm a very slow learner. This is my 29th year of telling stories. About 22 years in, I was walking in my house one day and I said, yeah, storytelling helped my kids. It helped my kids. Oh, wait a second, storytelling helped me? I kind of felt like, duh because I faked that I was proud. I faked that I was strong while my children were small. So that when they became tall, and now that I'm small, they would be strong. My eldest son and daughter-in-law, they gave birth just three months ago to my first grandchild, Addie. And I know my children put up with racism, and I still do but I really don't want my granddaughter to ever live in a racist world. So I feel more determined than ever to share stories, especially this one, with others, because we are human beings. We have hearts beating inside our chests. We have stomachs that get hungry. We get a throat, we have a throat that gets thirsty. And hopefully, hopefully now that you know about how many ancestors love you, you'll know that you're surrounded by love always. So I want to thank you so much for listening. How uh, Chen Kwan Man told me. Oh, I do have a few books. There's no pressure at all to buy anything, but I did bring a few books because they just arrived just when I was leaving to come here today. They said they wanted to come, I guess. Thank you so much. I'll be outside. Yes. 
Thank you so much, Kunja Day, for sharing all of your gifts with us today, your language, your songs, your life journey, your stories, your beauty, and also for one of the biggest life lessons that you've had about loving yourself and loving everyone else and for giving us that assignment <laughs> um, for the rest of our lives. And um, I know that it was very important for Sarah Bain, who was um, the main organizer behind uh, this conference that we're all at uh, today and we'll be coming back to tomorrow for you to be here. And uh, Sarah said that, I hope people get it. Like, I hope they get why she's here. And, uh, and I, know, I know that I do deep, deep within my soul. And um, it was a pleasure to have you just share who you are and share who your people are. And, um, and I know that everybody else here feels the same way. So um, if you wanna buy her books, uh, she'll be around just as we're wrapping up. So um, I think that that would be a gift for any, any child um, who is in your life or any adult child that's in your life that enjoys stories. So I just wanna thank everyone for coming here today. And I'm looking forward, we have another wonderful full day tomorrow. Um, and I just, before we end, we have door prizes to do. Um, and you do have to be here uh, to claim your door prizes. So I just wanna cue Joanna um, with her online wheel. Um, so you either have to be in the Zoom room or be here live for the two door prizes. And as that's being queued up by Joanna, I just really want to acknowledge um, the British Columbia Assembly of First Nations for bringing us all here today and for the organizers um, that have worked so hard. Sarah Bain, who's hiding, um, I see her <laughs> in the back, um, who many of you know, uh, and Joanna and the rest of the BCAFN staff that is here um, because this takes a lot of work to put together and I know that they did it in under two months. So just really want to give them a round of applause um, for the hard work that they put into this conference right before we do the door prizes. So if you can join me in that, that would be great. And if we want to roll the dice or spin the wheel for the first door prize, that would be awesome. Oh good, we've got sound. Victoria Graham, Victoria Graham, awesome, congratulations Victoria, a BCAFN staff will be in touch for your snail mail address, one more. I'm going to, Elvis Fellner? Okay, he's not online, so we'll roll again. Oh. Yes, yes, we got that, yeah. So if we can roll again. Elvis isn't online, I'm being told. Elvis has left the building. <laughs> Maybe I'm showing my age with that comment, but. <laughs> Maud Morris. <laughs> no, Elvis and Maud have both left the building. Another roll.
Awesome. I hear that Prudence George is in the Zoom room. So congratulations to Prudence and Victoria for your door prizes. We're all clapping here for you. So I just want to end by um, saying that we will start breakfast at 8 a.m. Um, in the other room and the official agenda will start at 9 a.m. So just wishing everybody a good evening um, and that you get to enjoy the city and the company of all the wonderful people that are here or your friends and family that you connect with after. So thank you to all the speakers today, to all the vendors. Um, and to all of you for taking time to take part in the BCAFN Economic Development Forum for 2022. And we will see you tomorrow morning, bright and early at 8 a.m. Take care.